Look at this pretty creature. It looks cute and totally harmless. But you should know that appearances are deceptive, and the blue-ringed octopus is an extremely venomous species of octopus. In fact, they are one of the world's most venomous marine animals. These creatures are found in tide pools and coral reefs. Despite their small size, a mere 5 to 8 inches, they are very dangerous to humans if provoked. Their venom contains a powerful neurotoxin called tetrodotoxin. When the animal feels threatened, its first instinct is to flee. But if the threat persists, for example, if you don't give up the idea of picking the octopus up, it will go into a defensive stance and display its blue rings. If the octopus is cornered and touched, it may bite its attacker, and it can end very, very badly. Tetrodotoxin causes severe consequences and sometimes results in total body paralysis. When the victim is fully aware of the surroundings but unable to move, the victim remains conscious and alert, but because of the paralysis, there's no way of signaling for help or indicating distress. Interestingly, in its chilling mode, the blue-ringed octopus looks brown or even pale, but once it feels endangered, it switches on its psychedelic pattern. Such a response is called aposematic behavior. In simple words, it's when an animal flashes bright colors warning others that, should they take a bite, they won't live to tell the tale. Of course, the blue-ringed octopus isn't the only dangerous animal that looks harmless out there. For example, look at this creature. This animal looks super cute, fluffy and soft looking. The desire to touch it is irresistible. Watch out. The sting of the hairy caterpillar can pack a serious punch. It's called the puss moth caterpillar or asp. Hidden among that luxurious fur, there are venom spines equipped with stinging cells like jellyfish. People react very differently to caterpillar toxins. Some may develop more severe reactions than others. Plus, how bad the consequences are also depends on the thickness of the skin in the affected area. In most cases, the unpleasant sensations and rash go away in a few hours or sometimes days. The next animal on our list is the poison dart frog. There are more than 170 species of these frogs, and funnily enough, not all of them are actually poisonous. Those which are secret, extremely dangerous toxins through their skin. On the bright side, the frogs never use these toxins for hunting or attacking. They only have them for self-defense. Experts aren't sure, but they suppose that the frog's ability to produce these toxins might come from a diet rich in toxin-containing animals, for example, centipedes or ants. Indigenous peoples in Central and South America have been known to rub their arrows and darts on the frogs in order to give them a poison tip. The main thing you need to keep in mind, if you touch a poison dart frog, seek assistance immediately. Especially if you've come across the golden poison dart frog, it's the most toxic one. The flamboyant cuttlefish is the only known venomous cuttlefish species. This creature has incredibly poisonous muscle tissue, despite its tiny two to three inches at most frame. Watch out for a dark brown underwater animal with two tentacles and eight arms. It's also likely to have purple and yellow around its arms. Anyway, your best bet is to avoid biting into one of these intriguing creatures, and you'll most likely be safe. Predatory cone snails are very slow animals. This is the main reason why they have no means to capture their prey mechanically. I mean, they can't really grasp another animal or bite it. Instead, the cone snail has evolved potent venom that helps it survive. Probably the coolest thing about these creatures is that, among almost 1,000 species, there's no overlap in the toxins produced by each of them. Even though cone snails don't have fangs, they have a venom-covered harpoon they use to sting their prey. There's a tube-like structure at the end of a venom bulb, and a modified tooth can shoot out of the tube at a mind-boggling speed of 400 miles per hour. So being slow pokes doesn't actually bother cone snails. And since the venom is unique to certain species, some of them can deliver a minor sting, while others might cause serious harm to your health. For example, this reef-dwelling little fella unleashes a harpoon-like tooth to sting its prey, and there is no known cure for its venom. When you think of puffer fish, you probably imagine a bloated-looking creature with impressive 360-degree quills. But beneath those funny spikes, there is a vicious creature. And the most dangerous part of this creature is its poison, which is considered to be one of, if not the, most dangerous and potent in the world. The good news is that you won't get poisoned unless you eat the fish. So maybe, better stick to the California roll. Now look at this insect and try to never approach it. It's the Japanese giant hornet. This monstrously sized creature, which can grow to be almost two inches long, is known to be highly aggressive. 
Its impressive stinger packs enough venom to make the sting very, and I mean it, painful. Some people don't survive being stung by this insect. Even though the venom isn't the most potent, the large size of the creature makes the dose too big. And if it's not one but several hornets attacking you, well, the consequences are likely to be dramatic. The giant hornet isn't necessarily unfriendly toward people or other animals, but it will sting if you provoke it. This truly beautiful bright blue creature is called the Blue Sea Dragon. Despite such an imposing name, the critter is actually tiny, usually no bigger than a grape. You may find it on the beach or floating beside you in the water. Now, you need to remember one thing. However pretty this little slug may look, never ever touch it. Despite their tiny size, their sting can pack a punch, all because of their diet. Their favorite dish is the Portuguese Man of War, a jellyfish that has enough venom to paralyze small fish and crustaceans. The blue dragons first use mucus to neutralize the jellyfish's infamous stinging cells, and then they steal these cells from the Man of War's tentacles and store and concentrate them within their own tissues. Then they release these stinging cells on contact, which makes their own sting even more powerful even worse than that of the Man of Wars itself. These awesome creatures are also extremely sneaky. Even though their appearance is bright, to say the least, they're well-known masters of disguise. You see, that vibrant blue coloring is actually on their bellies. And when they float on their backs, they simply blend with the water. As for their backs, they're gray to camouflage these animals on the sea surface. The Arukanji jellyfish found in Australia looks tiny and totally innocent but appearances are deceitful, and this baby the size of a human thumbnail is actually extremely dangerous. During stinger season, which lasts from November to May, tons of beaches get closed because of these itsy bitsy creatures. What makes the jellyfish particularly dangerous is their miniature size. People simply fail to notice them while swimming. The infamous box jellyfish named for its cubic body shape lives in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Stay away if you spot a creature with a squarish bell and long dangling tentacles. And even if you only see a single tentacle without the jellyfish attached to it, don't come close or touch it. The box jellyfish can grow up to 10 feet, and each of its tentacles has about 500,000 microscopic harpoons to inject venom. Unlike other jellyfish, box jellyfish are hunters. They can latch onto you by wrapping their slender tentacles around your limb or body. With how dangerous their venom is, it won't be a pleasant experience. Life is full of weird things, so how about we check a few of them out? Imagine you decided to go out for an afternoon walk. But 10 minutes into your walk, you run into some really, really bizarre stuff. Let's see if you can guess which of the items on this list happened in real life or if they came straight out of an otherworldly science fiction movie. In a dumpster on the street corner where your building is located, you find a big white bag. The type you would have to denounce if you were at an airport. It's suspicious and, oh no, there's something moving inside of it. You dare to approach it, carefully of course. You want to open it, but decide it's better to do it with a long stick. So that's what you decide to do, only to find out that inside it, there are over 10 live coiled snakes. I mean, who throws away a bag of snakes? Even if this situation is a big security hazard, it happened several years ago in England. Well, that was shocking, but you came out of it with all your fingers, so that's a win. Further down the street, you spot another live animal running around all by itself. It's a chicken this time. You look around to see if you can find its owner, but the chicken seems to be completely on its own. What is this supposed to be? A remake of the Chicken Run movie? Or is this what they call a free-range chicken in city areas? Now, if you guessed this was real, you guessed right. It also happened in England, where a CCTV camera caught footage of this weird event. Now, if you want to multiply that by millions, then check out the island of Oahu in Hawaii, where fabulous flocks of feral chickens roam around the place free as a bird. Meanwhile, you approach a part of the town that's neighbored by a small forest and decide to explore a bit. You don't come here much, so everything is kind of a surprise. You come to the first figure that makes you a little scared. I mean, is this supposed to be Groot from Guardian of the Galaxy? It sure looks like the Keeper of the Forest, or at least someone put these branches together to look like this. But it's just a natural phenomenon. 
I guess Mother Nature also likes to engage in some art-making, huh? Moving past the forest guardian, you run into what looks like a small mountain of something. But what could it be? Is it made out of clay? You approach it more and more until the blob starts to reveal itself more clearly. You can't believe what you're seeing. These are hundreds of hills of pasta. Pasta! That delicious Italian dish that almost everyone in the world loves. How could someone throw this crazy amount of pasta away? Judging by your last encounter, you thought this was nature-made as well. But probably, some restaurant made too much spaghetti and threw it away after it went bad. This fact may be disturbing, but it happened in real life. On the outskirts of New Jersey, someone did run into a hundred little pasta hills. The mystery of how the pasta got there still remains. The pasta incident made your heart break a little, but you continue on your walk. And that's when you find an old, abandoned house. It looks like nobody has been here for a very long time. You see the usual stuff an abandoned house has. A ripped-up couch, some pots and pans scattered on the floor, old pieces of cloth hanging around. But the surprise lies on the basement floor. Once you go down, you're completely caught off guard when you see a huge water tank with something swimming inside of it. Oh my, can that really be a shark? Yup. And her name is Rosie. Recently, an urban explorer went to check out an abandoned wildlife amusement park in Australia and found Rosie in a tank. She hadn't been alive for years, but how bizarre is that? Back in a bustling part of town, you stop in front of an electronic shop. The TVs on display are showing some of the world's most bizarre and unique natural phenomena. Since you've been experiencing a lot of bizarreness for the past hours, you stay and watch. Have you ever seen a rose lake before? This hasn't been tainted on purpose, of course. There's one in Senegal, Africa. The so-called Lake Ripa, or Loch Rose as known by locals, has become internationally famous for shining in its vivid pink color. It's one of the world's saltiest lakes, with a saline level of over 40%. And in case you were wondering why the water is pink, I assure you this has nothing to do with otherworldly factors. It's actually due to the high levels of salt. There's an algae that lives there that produces red pigments. Even if you thought this could be fiction, nah, it's really real. And you can travel there anytime you want to. After all this exploring, you stop to buy a burger in the street joint. Once you're finished, you walk to the nearest dumpster to throw away your garbage. But, oh no, it looks like the trash is moving again. You've already seen a family of snakes this morning, what could you find now? Well, before you can get any closer, a black bear pokes his head out of the trash. Ah! You scream and get as far away from it as you can. Phew! That was close. I mean, it's not every day people find wild animals in dumpsters. But this is also a true story. A garbage cleaner had a real-life encounter with a bear and made it out all in one piece. Well, good for him. Moving on, further down the street, you find an old abandoned building. Since it's never a good idea to go inside, that's of course exactly what you do. This place feels like you were teleported to ancient Egypt. The building itself looks like an old Egyptian temple built in sand-colored stones. The first thing you see is a statue of a pharaoh. But then you notice some pizza ovens. Was this an Egyptian-themed pizza parlor? You find some flyers around that explain everything to you. The enterprise was meant to be called Pizza Tut, but halfway through renovations, the company ran out of money and abandoned the whole thing altogether. The best part? Pizza Tut would have existed in New Jersey if it hadn't gone broke. Too bad it closed down, right? Well, next, you grab your phone and figure out you have no idea where you are. You put your address on Google Maps, but before it gives you any results, your internet goes down. It starts raining like there's no tomorrow. As you seek shelter from the rain, a huge thunderstorm begins. Thankfully, you're safe. But you see something you've never seen before. Like an upside-down bolt of lightning coming from the ground up to the sky. Is that even scientific? Yes, it is. Lightning can move either downwards or upwards, from sky to earth or from earth to sky. This can happen when there's a tall object near the spot of the lightning discharge, and the electric field of the flash causes the light to travel from ground to cloud, as scientists call it. 
I find this shocking. Okay, you were definitely not prepared for all of this. As the storm calms down, you get an Uber home. No more walking for you today. On the ride home, your Uber goes off the path. He says he knows a good shortcut. In a few minutes, you can't believe what your eyes are seeing. You're inside a tunnel, way under street level, and your Uber driver is showing you an old deactivated metro station. Similar to City Hall Station in New York City, built in the early 1900s. It's so beautiful, with brass chandeliers and multicolored tile arches. You take a selfie, of course. Hey, who knows? Your Uber drives you out of the tunnel, and you definitely feel like you just time-traveled. He leaves you on your doorstep, and you give a big sigh. Finally! Oh my god! I bet you've seen and lived through enough bizarre experiences for a lifetime. Wouldn't you say so? What were your guesses? I bet you imagine most of these things were made up, huh? Now, prepare yourself for some weird stuff. We're going to dive into the fascinating world of sea cucumbers, the squishy detritivores that are nature's very own recyclers. These exotic marine creatures might not be everyone's first choice for a pet. But trust me, they've got some unique talents that are worth talking about. Sea cucumbers are colorful little creatures with a digestive tract that's basically just a hole at either end. Their bodies are fat and squishy, covered in leathery skin. And guess what? They breathe through their butts. These amazing creatures have found a way to make the most out of every part of their body, few as they are. Now, you might be wondering what sea cucumbers do with their unique set of skills. Well, they play a crucial role in cleaning our planet's waters. They munch on all the debris found on the seabed and break it down internally, removing all the bad stuff in the process. It's like having little vacuums cleaning up the ocean floor. Believe it or not, sea cucumbers are in high demand in the kitchen, too. They're harvested and traded in many countries. The Asian market, in particular, absolutely loves them. You can find them being sold cooked and dried under all sorts of fancy names. Or, if you prefer a more direct approach, you can just call them sea slugs. Now, here's the fun part. A dried sea cucumber can cost you up to a whopping $1,400 per pound. These squishy delicacies are truly worth their weight. But let's take a step back in time. The tradition of eating sea cucumbers goes way back, more than a thousand years in Asia to be precise. And as demand for these curious creatures grew, so did the need to find them elsewhere. This led to over-exploitation of local fisheries causing sea cucumber stocks to diminish in many countries. Uh Uh-oh, not good for our little sea cucumber friends. One of the most interesting examples of sea cucumbers is the pink see-through Fantasia. Not only does it look amazing, but it also has this great defense system, where it uses bioluminescence to scare off predators. Thankfully, some brilliant researchers around the world have decided to act. They're on a mission to breed sea cucumbers and replenish the depleted fisheries. They're also exploring how these creatures can be a reasonable food resource and help reduce the damage done by fish farming. In Scotland, for instance, where a team of enthusiastic students started a company for this particular purpose. Their goal? To figure out how sea cucumbers can absorb as much of the bad stuff they can in the water. They might just be the aquatic superheroes we've been waiting for. Meanwhile, in Sweden, marine biologists are working hard to restore the population of red signal sea cucumbers. These poor creatures have been fished out of local waters, but specialists are determined to give them a fighting chance. They're also exploring how sea cucumbers can fit into seafood cultivation. Their lab is like a sea cucumber daycare, carefully nurturing the next generation of these wiggly wonders. And let's not forget about Canada. Research scientists are focusing on the giant red sea cucumber. These magnificent creatures can grow up to 20 inches long and are perfect for co-cultivation with other species. They're even developing special containment systems that will make it easier to keep sea cucumbers where they're needed the most. Okay, speaking of amazing sea creatures, what about a fish that can fly? Heard that right, we're about to stumble upon a land where fins meet flying and the ocean becomes a runway for these airborne acrobats. 
Prepare to be fantastically entertained. Nah, I didn't write that one. So picture this. You're lounging by the warm ocean waters, minding your own business, when suddenly you see a fish soaring through the air like a torpedo. That's right, they are real, and they got some serious style. With their sleek bodies and pectoral fins that resemble wings, they're the high flyers of the sea. Now, you might be wondering, why would a fish take to the skies? Well, it turns out these magnificent creatures have developed this nifty gliding ability as a sneaky trick to escape from their underwater foes. And boy, do they have plenty of enemies. Those guys are all on the lookout for a tasty flying fish snack. When it comes to their diet, these avian fishes are quite the foodies. They chow down on a variety of treats, including the ever-popular plankton. Mm -mm. Who knew tiny floating organisms could be so delicious? Now, let's take a closer look at the flying fish family album. We've got a whopping 40 known species strutting their stuff in the sky. And here's a fun fact. All of them have tails that are forked in an uneven manner with the lower lobe being longer than the upper one. It's like the fishy version of a funky hairstyle. And there's more. Some of these weird flyers even have supersized pelvic fins, giving them the appearance of having four wings. Can you imagine the envy in the fish community when they see these trendsetters gliding by? Okay, now let's get to the nitty-gritty of their airborne adventures. The flying fish takeoff is a sight to behold. First, they gather some serious speed underwater, reaching a zippy 37 miles per hour. That's faster than some highway speed limits. Then, like a rocket ready for blastoff, they angle themselves upward and break the ocean surface, ready to take flight. But they don't stop there. These thrill-seekers can reach heights of over 4 feet in the air. Can you imagine the view from up there? They glide through the sky, covering long distances. It's like the fishy equivalent of a marathon. And here's the best part. When they approach the water again, they can flap their tails and continue their flight without fully returning to the depths. These fishy flyers are also all about the nightlife. Just like partygoers flock to a glittering disco ball, flying fish are attracted to light. Crafty fishermen take advantage of this by setting up canoes with just the right amount of water to keep the fish comfy but prevent them from escaping. Then they add a luring light to the scene, and before you know it, flying fish are caught left and right, supplying a bountiful catch for those lucky fishermen. Don't worry though, these flying fish aren't on the endangered species list. Not yet at least. The next time you find yourself by the ocean, keep an eye out for these marvelous creatures. You never know when you'll see a flying fish extravaganza. Our next adventure takes us into the quirky world of underwater romance. Picture this. A scene that looks like someone doing the tango with their lunch. Wait, what? No, it's not a throwing up contest, I promise. We're diving headfirst into the jaw-dropping, pun intended, mating ritual of the jawfish. These curious creatures call the coral reefs of the Caribbean Sea and the Western Atlantic home. And boy, do they know how to make a spectacle of themselves. Forget about pickup lines or fancy gestures. These jawfish rely on their unique jaw-based moves to pursue their potential partners. It's like a dance-off, but with their mouths. Not only are these fishy fellas skilled in the art of sand scooping, but they also double as diligent parents. Talk about alliteration. I mean, talk about multitasking. The males take their parental duties to the next level by carrying the precious eggs in their giant mouths until they're ready to hatch. It's like they have their own aquatic daycare center going on. When they're not busy nurturing their offspring, these jawfish transform their mouths into fighting tools. That's right, it's time for the jawfish fighting championship. They go head-to-head, or rather mouth-to-mouth, in epic battles of mouth strength and agility. You know the old saying, put your money where your mouth is? Well, these jawfish take it to a whole new level. Whether it's for romance, parroting, or friendly competition, these jawfish show us that sometimes actions do really speak louder than words. They may look like they're having a bad seafood experience, but rest assured, 
It's just their unique way of finding love and expressing themselves. Are you a pro swimmer? Brave enough to take a dip in any ocean or sea? Bad news. There are some places you should avoid no matter how well you swim or dive. Some of these places have dangerous underwater rocks, strong currents and tides. Others are famous for legends about monsters and mysterious creatures. So let's dive into this aquatic horror show. Have you ever heard the word the strid? It's a variation of the word the stride that is used in Yorkshire. And it refers to a narrow section of the river wharf that's so small you could jump over it. But don't be fooled by its size, it's one of the most dangerous spots around. Even taking a step into the water can have dire consequences. The river wharf has a forceful current, and since the strid is so narrow, it's even stronger in that area. The intense water flow has eroded the limestone around the strid, which created hollow spaces much deeper than the rest of the riverbed. Here's the secret. The current has also weakened the banks of the strid from below. So, the ground you're standing on, admiring the rapid flow, is probably just a fragile ledge hanging over treacherous waters. There's no record of anyone who found themselves in the water of the strid and found their way out of it. And the worst part? You wouldn't even guess that this innocent looking stream could be such a danger. So, my advice to you, my friend, is to stick to a safer body of water for your aquatic adventures. If you're looking for a weekend getaway in California, Horseshoe Lake is the spot for you. It's got everything. Sandy beaches, hiking trails, and picnic areas, but wait, there's more to it than meets the eye. This lake has a dark side, namely around 100 acres of dead trees that surround it. And it's not just the trees that have been claimed by this lake. The earthquakes that hit in 1989 and 1990 unleashed carbon dioxide from under the hot magma. The gas seeped out into the air, damaging all the life around the lake. Even now, Horseshoe Lake is just as dangerous as it was 30 years ago. What makes it so scary is that the levels of this toxic gas change randomly. Warning signs that are posted everywhere certainly could give a horror film touch to a fun hike in the woods. In Kauai, Hawaii, there's a group of stunning waterfalls that used to be a popular destination for tourists. Kipu Falls, as they're called, were once the go-to spot for swimming and diving. To get to them, you had to take a long walk along a dirt path until you finally arrived at a breathtaking view of a 20-foot waterfall pouring into a crystal clear pool below. But since 2011, this area has been off limits to the public. Why, you ask? Well, there have been a lot of accidents at Kipu Falls. Obviously, jumping off the top of the waterfall would be an obvious reason for that. But in addition, there were much more mysterious cases. Witnesses tell tales of swimmers peacefully enjoying the pool at the bottom of the falls, only to be suddenly dragged under the surface. No definite explanation was found to these accidents. The locals believe that the water spirit Mo'o is to blame because it doesn't appreciate being disturbed by loud tourists. There's also a theory of a powerful whirlpool at the bottom of the pool. In any case, guide publishers do not mention Kipu Falls anymore, and trespassing is severely punished. The Samizan Hole, located in the Gulf of Thailand, is the ultimate spot for thrill-seeking divers, but it's also the most dangerous one. With a drop of 280 feet, it's the deepest diving site in the region. But its depth is not the only reason it is considered a place to avoid. The area is a major shipping zone for giant oil tankers. The strong currents around the hole make diving even more treacherous. And if that's not enough, the Samisan Hole is also home to deadly barracudas that could easily attack unsuspecting divers. The water is so murky that visibility is nearly zero, making it challenging to spot these aggressive sea creatures. All in all, the Samisan Hole is a breathtaking but extremely hazardous spot that should only be explored by experienced divers with nerves of steel. Let me tell you about New Smyrna Beach, the shark attack capital of the world. If you're looking for a relaxing vacation spot in Volusia County, Florida, you may want to reconsider this beach. The waters around New Smyrna Beach are teeming with fish, which attracts a lot of sharks. In fact, there have been so many shark attacks reported in this area 
that it's earned the title of the shark attack capital of the world. Even scientists have warned that if you go for a swim there, you're bound to get up close and personal with at least one of these creatures. We are talking about a distance of 10 feet, and in many cases you wouldn't even notice it. To make matters worse, the bull shark, one of the most dangerous and aggressive types of sharks, has been spotted in these waters. Once again, Kauai is on our list. The beach on Nepali coast called Hanakapiai Beach might look like heaven on earth, but don't be fooled. To get there, you have to trek through a super steep, rocky two-mile trail. There are no lifeguards on this remote beach, so even if you decide to take a dip in the water, you're on your own. The biggest threat to your safety is the incredibly strong rip currents. They are almost always present because there are no reefs to shield the shore. And if someone gets caught in one, there's no safe place to swim to for miles. The nearest safe beach is six miles away. Trust me, this beach doesn't have the best track record in terms of safety. So it's highly advised that you stay out of the water if you end up at this beach. Let me tell you about a place that looks like it's straight out of a horror movie. We're talking about Berkeley Pit, which is an artificial lake situated in Butte, Montana. The first thing you'll notice about this place is that it has an eerie blood-red color that can only be described as unsettling. You might be tempted to take a dip, but that would be a grave mistake. Don't even touch it. The water is extremely dangerous due to the heavy metals present in it, such as cadmium, arsenic, zinc, lead, and copper. They come from the rocks that surround the lake and make the water super acidic. In fact, this place used to be an open pit copper mine, hence its color. So if you want my advice, avoid this place like the plague. There are three lakes in Africa that maybe are the most dangerous places of all that I have mentioned so far. They're all located in Africa. Lake Monoon and Lake Nyos in Cameroon and Lake Kivu in Rwanda are all like ticking timers ready to go off. They were formed over underground pools of molten rock and sometimes this molten rock releases toxic gases like methane and carbon dioxide right into the water. When this happens, the gases can build up until they suddenly burst out of the water, creating massive waves that can wipe out everything in their path. This type of outburst is called a limnic eruption, and it can release a cloud of poisonous gas that can be harmful to everything in the vicinity. The most terrifying part these explosions can happen at any moment with no warning. So if you ever find yourself near one of these lakes, you'd better be on high alert, because you never know when the next accident might happen. Maybe you know other places you wouldn't recommend for a fun swim? Share your anti-recommendations in the comments below. Our ears can only hear sounds that fall within certain frequencies. Anything lower than 20 hertz is infrasonic and anything higher than 20 kilohertz is ultrasonic. But even within that range, there are still some sounds that we can't hear. It's like the universe is pranking us. Luckily, many of these sounds are annoying, and we wouldn't really want to hear them all the time anyway. Let's start with the sounds plants make. Apparently, plants can talk too. Well, not in the way we do, but they emit high-frequency sounds as loud as our conversations. What if your plant is thirsty and is trying to let you know about this? Unfortunately, these sounds are too high for our ears to hear. But insects, other mammals, and even other plants might be able to hear them. Research has revealed that plants like tomatoes that are stressed from dehydration can do that. The sound is too high for us to hear, but it resembles a snap, crackle, and pop, like the noise bubble wrap makes. Hey human, my friend wants water, please! According to Lelock Haddeny, an evolutionary biologist, even in a quiet field, there are actually sounds that we don't hear, and those sounds carry information. In other words, there is a whole acoustic world out there. In a recent study, researchers discovered that stressed plants that are dehydrated or have their stems cut emit more sounds than their healthy counterparts. These sounds can be detected by a machine learning algorithm that can differentiate between happy, thirsty and cut plants. And get this, 
Water-stressed plants start making noises before they're even visibly dehydrated. But why do plants emit sounds, you ask? Well, it's still unclear whether they're trying to communicate with us or other organisms. However, it's possible that other animals or insects have evolved to hear and respond to these sounds. It's also possible that other plants are listening in on the conversation. One thing is clear. For now, you never know what your cactus is trying to tell you. It turns out that sounds you can't hear can hurt your ears. Wind turbines, loud stadiums, and jet engines all produce sound waves too low for human ears to pick up. But that doesn't mean they won't mess with your inner ear. According to a recent study, listening to just 90 seconds of these low-frequency sounds can change the way your inner ear functions for a few minutes, even after the noise stops. Researchers used to think that low-frequency sounds were harmless, but a new study proves them wrong. It shows that these sounds can actually have an impact on your ears. Have you ever noticed how your ears ring for hours after a concert? Well, listening to loud noises over a long period of time can damage your hearing. Researchers have known about this for a while now. When it comes to low-frequency sounds, above 20 Hz but below 250 Hz, they're either inaudible or barely audible. People may not even know they're being exposed to them. To conduct the study, 21 volunteers with normal hearing were asked to listen to a 30 Hz sound for 90 seconds in a soundproof booth. This low vibrating noise is similar to what you'd hear if you opened your car windows while driving fast down a highway. After the noise ended, researchers recorded the natural activity of the ear using probes. They showed that the participants' ears were temporarily more prone to damage after being exposed to low-frequency sounds. The process is not painful, so you may not even realize you're being hurt. Have you ever wondered how loud the sun is? Well, imagine if every police siren on Earth was turned on and then multiply the noise by 10,000. That's how intense the sound of the sun is. Even though we're 92 million miles away from the sun, we'd still hear a dull roar of around 100 decibels, the same volume as at a rock concert. Can you imagine having to shout just to have a conversation with someone right next to you? It's a good thing we don't have to deal with that constant noise, because researchers think we would have never been able to develop speech if we were surrounded by that kind of sound all the time. The super loud sound would only be around during the day, so we could enjoy some peace and quiet at night. I mean, of course, we can't hear the sun at all because, you know, there's no air and space for sound to travel through. What about motion detector lights and alarms? Well, get ready for some ultrasonic knowledge. Most of these security systems use sound waves that are too high-pitched for our human ears to hear. We're talking about 30 kilohertz to 50 kilohertz. So, if you're not a bat, you won't hear a thing. But here's the really cool part. Ultrasonic sound waves can't pass through solid objects, making them perfect for detecting movement in a specific area. Whether it's a monster or an intruder, these security systems have got you covered. There are two types of ultrasonic security systems out there. The first one listens for ultrasonic sounds in the environment, while the other sends out ultrasonic waves and waits for the response. When the system detects any changes in the ultrasonic sounds bouncing around the area, the device knows it's time to activate and keep you safe. Can you hear a black hole? NASA says it's a mix of creepy and ethereally beautiful. They released an audio clip called a black hole remix from a galaxy cluster known as Perseus, located 240 million light years away from Earth. There is sound in space as long as there is a medium for sound waves to travel through, like gas. So, how come they recorded it? Well, the clip is not an actual sound recording of a black hole, but rather a remixed version of sound waves that were detected in 2003. At that time, researchers from NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory discovered that pressure waves sent out by the black hole caused ripples in the cluster's hot gas that could be translated into a note. 
Since the note's frequency was too low to be heard, the astronomers at Chandra had to remix and increase the frequency by 57 and 58 octaves. This led to an eerie guttural moan, which is the sound you can hear today. Although the sound is not what humans would hear in the presence of a black hole, it still gives us an idea of what it would be like. Volcanoes are extremely loud when they erupt, but they also have a secret sound. It's infrasound, which means that it's too low-pitched for us humans to hear. It's like the sound equivalent of a dog whistle, but for volcanoes. Still, just because we can't hear it doesn't mean it's not dangerous. Infrasound can travel for miles and can pack a punch, even when it's not audible. Scientists have even set up stations to detect infrasound from far away volcanoes. They use this information to figure out what kind of eruption is happening and what's going on inside the volcano. Here's the crazy part. Volcanoes make infrasonic sounds all the time, not just when they erupt. It's like they're always humming a tune. And scientists use this hum to keep an ear on the volcano's lava levels. Who knew volcanoes were such musical creatures? Next up, we have bat echolocation. We're often told that bats can't see. But that's a myth. They can actually see but don't always rely on their eyes to navigate the world. Instead, they use sound, more specifically, ultrasonic sound waves. Bats release these sound waves from their mouths or nostrils. The waves bounce off of everything in their path and come back to them as echoes. This allows them to see obstacles and even find yummy snacks. Those sounds can be super loud. We're talking louder than smoke detector level decibels. So next time you hear a bat making a noise, just remember, these creatures aren't trying to be annoying. They're just using their superpowers to get around. Have you ever seen a sea cucumber lying on a bed of sand and thought it looked like a blob? Well, these creatures may seem squishy and defenseless, but they actually have some fascinating strategies to keep themselves safe. Biologists uncovered chemical compounds with the help of which sea cucumbers protect themselves from predators and even from their own toxins. And guess what? These compounds might be useful for human health. When sea cucumbers feel threatened, they can expel thread-like parts of their bodies. These tubes immobilize predators in a sticky, toxic embrace. The toxicity comes from some chemical compounds commonly found in plants. Interestingly, these chemicals are much less common in animals, but sea cucumbers have evolved to use them to their advantage. The substances are also known for their antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties. They're already used in a bunch of industries, like cosmetics. But using these chemicals as a defense creates a big problem for sea cucumbers. They need to avoid damaging themselves with their own toxins. It means their own cells can't contain cholesterol, the target that the toxins bind to and pierce. Instead, sea cucumbers have developed two kinds of cholesterol alternatives. It's a self-defense strategy, you see? If you can produce these toxic substances, you have to be able to not make yourself sick. Smart and cute as they are, now you know not to touch a sea cucumber should you ever stumble upon one at the beach. Speaking of things you should avoid at the beach, let's move on to the marbled cone snail, a creature so unique and dangerous that it'll make your head spin. This one is quite the world traveler. It can be found all the way from the southern tip of India to Okinawa, Japan, and southeast to New Caledonia and Samoa. That's quite an impressive range. And it's not just where it's found that's interesting, it's how it hunts. This snail may be small, but it's a fierce predator. It loves to chow down on other snails and sometimes even its own kind. When it's hungry, it'll stick out its long white tooth and shoot a poison-laden harpoon at its prey. And if that doesn't do the trick, it'll attack its prey multiple times over, just to be sure. Talk about determination, right? Once the harpoon hits its mark, the prey becomes immobilized and its muscles begin to relax irreversibly. And when the prey is helpless, the snail can begin to munch on it. Where can you find this fearsome creature, you might ask? 
Well, it's found in fairly shallow waters, typically on coral reef platforms or lagoon pinnacles, as well as in sand, under rocks, or among the seagrass. Watch your step the next time you're out for a swim, just saying. On the bright side, did you know that this snail's venom is being developed as a potential treatment for pain? Some of the chemicals found in this substance have been studied and they're showing promise. Who knew that this unusual predator could have a softer side too? Next on your list of creatures to avoid should be a little fish called the stonefish. Now you might think this sounds like a cute little pet rock, but let me tell you, it's not to be messed with. In fact, it's the most venomous fish in the entire ocean. These guys are masters of disguise, blending right in with their surroundings at rocky or muddy bottoms of marine habitats in the Indo-Pacific region. They're like the ninjas of the sea, waiting patiently for their prey to swim by before <laughs> swiftly attacking and swallowing it whole. But here's the thing, you could easily swim right by a stonefish without even realizing it's there. Now, I know what you're thinking. I don't want to accidentally step on a stonefish. And trust me, you really don't. These guys have a lot of spines lining their backs, and they release venom when they're stepped on. Ouch! That venom can cause terrible pain, swelling, and damaged tissues. Not exactly a good day at the beach if you ask me. But don't worry, the stonefish isn't out to get you. It uses its spines defensively, not offensively. So, as long as you're not disturbing it or stepping on it, you should be fine. Just be careful where you step and maybe invest in some water shoes. And if you do happen to get stung, seek specialized attention immediately. It's best to always look where you walk, shuffle your feet along the bottom to avoid stepping directly on the fish, and wear water shoes when you're in an area that could be home to stonefish. Have you ever had the pleasure of meeting a lionfish up close? They're such beautiful creatures with all those colors and fins that look like wings and accessories. It's easy to be mesmerized by their elegance, but don't be fooled by their stunning appearance. They're not to be messed with. In fact, they're one of the most dangerous fish in the ocean. If you get stung, you'll experience a lot of pain maybe even some allergic reactions. Lionfish inject venom through their needle-sharp dorsal and pelvic fins. They're not aggressive and won't sting you out of the blue, but they will act in self-defense if provoked or caught. It's not just their venom that makes them dangerous. They also have tiny teeth. But instead of using them to bite predators, they have something even more dangerous, their fins. The lionfish uses these spine-like fins to ward off predators. And unfortunately, that includes humans. So, while it might be tempting to swim up close to a fish and say hello, beware of its sharp spines. But here's the thing. Lionfish can be eaten. Some say they're actually quite delicious. And since they're a threat to reef ecosystems, human consumption is encouraged. Just make sure you remove the venomous spines first. If you're snorkeling or swimming near the corals in the Atlantic or Pacific Ocean, you might encounter these stunning fish. Keep a reasonable distance between you and the lionfish and they won't feel threatened or startle enough to sting you in self-defense. Sea urchins might also cause some trouble if stumbled upon. Don't worry, they won't be jumping off the reef and flinging spines at you. They're not aggressive at all. These creatures are everywhere, from rocky shores to coral reefs, and are quite common in almost every body of salt water, including all of the world's oceans. So it's not surprising that sea urchin injuries are pretty common too. But hey, accidents happen, especially when we're distracted by a cute little turtle or too excited about exploring a new dive site. Now, let's talk about their defense mechanisms. These little guys have two ways of defending themselves, their spines and these tiny jaw-like structures that can inject a painful substance. Some species have long, sharp spines that can easily pierce even a thick wetsuit and lodge deep in your skin. Yikes! But don't worry, avoiding sea urchins is not rocket science. 
Just try to maintain a good awareness of your surroundings. Watch out for protruding spines in the sand and control your buoyancy. It'll help you stay at least a few feet away from corals, which may conceal urchins in their crevices. And if a shore entry has many urchins, pick a different dive site. No biggie. Now let's talk about first aid for sea urchin stings. Soaking the area in hot water for up to an hour and a half can break down the dangerous substance and alleviate the pain. Carefully remove the spines with tweezers and shave the area to remove those pesky spikes. Then wash the injured area with soap and rinse with fresh water. Apply topical creams if you have any in your beach bag too. And of course, watch for signs of allergies and contact a specialist immediately if you notice something weird. But hey, let's not forget that sea urchins are just one of many hazards of the deep. There are bearded fireworms, pufferfish, and fire coral too. So let's not be too hard on our little urchin friends. After all, compared to some of these other creatures, they're pretty tame. If you've ever been to Yellowstone National Park, you were probably mesmerized by its geysers, which spew superheated water and steam high into the air. But an even more intriguing thing actually hides underground. I'm talking about that underfoot plumbing system that makes those grand eruptions possible. About that, there's good news. Recently, researchers have succeeded in mapping the National Park's hydrothermal plumbing system with the help of a giant flying magnet. As a result, scientists have managed to document all these features in stunning detail. The thing is, Yellowstone houses the world's largest hydrothermal system. It contains over 10,000 features, like geysers, mud pots, hot springs, and steam vents. They're fed by a network of underground water pathways. Those get overheated by magma flowing underground. It causes the water to rise to the surface. Now, no one actually knows much about the workings of this system but the newly created maps might finally shed light on it. Experts explain that their knowledge of Yellowstone has a subsurface gap. That's why it's often called a mystery sandwich. Scientists know quite a lot about the features on the surface because they can observe them directly. And they know what's going on in the magmatic and tectonic system several miles below the surface. But they haven't figured out what's happening in the middle yet. So, I must tell you about that giant flying magnet used for research. It's known as SkyTem. It was attached to a helicopter and flown over Yellowstone several hundred times, scanning the ground below. The magnet is made up of an 82-foot-wide charged wire loop. Its main task is to generate a strong electromagnetic field. And since different kinds of material, like water or rock, respond to this field differently, scientists managed to create a few subsurface maps for the first time ever. The mapping technique also allowed the researchers to differentiate between magma and bedrock, since they have a bit different magnetic properties. And the team got a chance to see how the magma and water interact and create those mind-blowing geological features on the surface. The team got high-resolution maps to a depth of around 500 and 2300 feet, and low-resolution maps showing what's going on at a depth of up to 1.5 miles. At the same time, the researchers think that the hydrothermal system itself may stretch as far as 3 miles below the surface. If they're right, it means they've only mapped the top half of Yellowstone's plumbing system. Anyway, remember how I said that scientists know pretty much about the bottom part of the Yellowstone sandwich? They have such a good idea about the tectonic plates and deep fault lines because the park's frequent earthquakes provide them with a lot of opportunities to study different phenomena. In July 2021, for example, more than 1,000 earthquakes rocked the area. These days, the team of researchers knows much more about some famous features, like the old faithful geyser or the Grand Prismatic Spring. They've also found out that individual hydrothermal features on the surface can actually be connected to others, which can be as far as 6 miles away from them. Another interesting discovery is that even though Yellowstone geysers and hot springs vary in size, shape, color, volatility, and chemical composition, they are mostly fed by very similar underground sources. That means that the difference between the features appears closer to the surface. Now, I'm sure you've seen the iconic image of Yellowstone with a large rainbow-colored spring 
fiery orange at its edges. So what makes these hot springs so colorful? Surprisingly, these awesome hues come from microscopic creatures. The temperatures in the springs are so high, they can easily and quickly cook you. Plus, the water there is super acidic, like the liquid in a car battery. But there are certain types of heat-loving microbes that don't mind these crazy conditions. You can even say they're thriving there. So every ring of a different color is, in most cases, a ring inhabited by different bacteria. And each species is adapted to a particular temperature or pH level, which measures how acidic this or that environment is. For example, take the Grand Prismatic Spring, yes, the iconic one. Its rainbow hues likely hint at the diversity of microbes living there. So, starting from the center of the hot spring, you can see a beautiful aquamarine color there. That's where the water temperature is the highest, reaching 189 degrees Fahrenheit, because this area is right over the underground water source. The water there is too hot even for microbes. That's why what you see is mostly clear water. As for the reason for its blue color, it's the same as why the sky is blue. Sunlight hits the surface of the water, and the light scatters. But the blue light scatters the most, getting reflected back to your eyes. Now, the next ring of color is yellow, all thanks to certain cyanobacteria. The temperature in this yellow ring reaches 165 degrees Fahrenheit. If the conditions in the hot spring were a bit different, these bacteria would create a blue-green hue, thanks to a green pigment called chlorophyll. But since the sunlight hitting the spring is too intense, the bacteria start producing another type of pigment. It's called carotenoids. And guess what? It acts as a sunscreen for the bacteria. And since this pigment is orange, the normally green bacteria get a yellowish hue. And finally, we've got that bright orange color closer to the edges of the prismatic spring. It's a bit cooler there, around 149 degrees Fahrenheit. In this part of the spring, you can find several types of bacteria. They all produce substances that give the spring this bright orange color. And finally, right at the edges of the spring, the temperature is cooler, around 131 degrees, and a greater variety of microbes can survive there. All of them combined give the edges of the spring that red-brown hue. But scientists believe that people and their activity may have influenced the colors of Yellowstone's hydrothermal features. For example, in the past, the temperatures in the morning glory pool used to be much higher than they are today. That's why its color was a deep blue. But trash has started to accumulate in the pool, and some of it clogged the vent. This caused the temperatures to drop, which led to microbial growth. As a result, that pretty blue color turned into orange-yellow. As for Yellowstone's geysers, the most famous one is called Old Faithful. It got this name at the end of the 19th century because of how regular its eruptions were. This geyser is more active than the others, erupting about 20 times a day. Each of these magnificent events lasts from 1 to 5 minutes. And the fountain of steaming water can reach a height of 180 feet. Now, while talking about Yellowstone National Park, we can't but mention Yellowstone Supervolcano, right? Supervolcanoes appear when huge volumes of magma are trying to escape from deep underground. Eventually, they burst through Earth's surface. Sometimes, all this magma gets stuck, unable to break through the planet's crust. And then, massive pools of pressurized magma gather at a depth of several miles. The pressure keeps growing because more and more magma is trying to get to the surface. At one point, a super eruption goes off. You don't necessarily want to be around for that. Over the past 50 years, the Yellowstone caldera has risen almost 3 feet. It shouldn't alarm you, though. Experts are sure it's a natural behavior for Yellowstone. Periods of dome-shaped uplift are followed by the caldera lowering. Scientists think the supervolcano doesn't present any danger at the moment. For an eruption to happen, the magma inside has to be at least 50% molten. With Yellowstone, this number is just 5-15%. to 15%. Even better, a recent study made the researchers believe the hot spot might be in a state of decline right now, even despite all the breathing and dome-raising activity. There have been at least three other super eruptions in the history of Yellowstone Volcano. They happened 2.1 million, 1.3 million, and 640,000 years ago, long before video. 
The most recent super eruption was dubbed the Lava Creek Eruption. It formed the Yellowstone Caldera after spilling out 240 cubic miles of rock, dust, and volcanic ash. No thanks, I'll pass. Hi there! Have you ever wondered why birds tend to fly in circles? It's because of thermals. Now, a thermal is like a big bubble of warm air that rises up from the ground. Have you ever flown a kite on a windy day and watch it go up and down? Well, imagine if the wind was warm instead of cold, and instead of a kite, you were a bird or a glider. So yeah, that warm wind would be a thermal. Thermals occur when the sun heats up the earth, and the air close to the ground gets warm and starts to rise. This creates a column of rising air that birds and gliders can ride on to go up into the sky. Just like how you use the wind to fly a kite, birds can use thermals to soar without flapping their wings too much. They can circle inside the thermal and go higher and higher without using up too much energy. Those that especially tend to use this flying in circles mode are large raptors, such as hawks, vultures, and eagles. When these birds circle in the sky, it looks like they're just hanging there. But nope, it's all about thermals again. It helps them because as they go higher without getting tired, they can look for food more easily or watch out for predators from a good position in the sky. Thermals are important for some other animals that fly too, like insects. You may see lots of birds flying in circles together. Sticking together helps them save even more energy. Some birds, like geese and ducks, tend to fly in a V formation to save their strength. What's interesting is that all the birds in the flock take turns leading the V. As they fly, the birds at the front get tired, so they fall back, and another bird takes their place as the leader. This way, every bird gets a chance to rest and save energy. Thermals can also create powerful storms, like thunderstorms. And sometimes, when you see birds flying in circles or a V-shape, it's because they sense a storm is coming. This happens because bad weather comes hand-in-hand hand with low pressure. Low pressure systems are areas in the atmosphere where the air pressure is lower than the surrounding areas. When the pressure drops, it can cause the air to move and create wind. If there's enough moisture in the air, the low pressure can even cause thunderstorms, heavy rains, or even hurricanes. Migratory birds are often those who use their keen sense of hearing and vision to detect changes in weather conditions. When a storm is approaching, there can be changes in air pressure, wind speed, and temperature, which can affect their behavior. Some other animals have interesting types of behavior when the bad weather is coming too. Cows and other livestock may huddle together in a group for warmth and protection during a storm. Also, cows are known to lie down in a field before a storm as a way to ease this discomfort. Or at least that may be something you've heard. So, what have you heard about this herd? Well, the belief is that cows predict the weather and lie down because they can feel a drop in air pressure that comes with an approaching storm. But science hasn't confirmed it yet, since there's not enough evidence to support this idea. Cows do like to lie down from time to time, but they do it for a variety of reasons, such as to rest or ruminate. So when you see one lying down, you can't be sure it's because bad weather is coming. Different studies show different results. One found out cows didn't show any significant changes in behavior before the rain, while another study found that cows stood up more often as the rain was coming. Apparently, no one has actually asked the cows about this, but the cows aren't talking, which is why this point is moot. Amphibians, such as frogs and toads, can give us information about natural phenomena. When you hear frogs croaking louder and longer than usual, it might indicate that a storm is approaching. Frogs are sensitive to changes in humidity and air pressure, and they tend to become more active and vocal just before a storm. And when it comes to toads, research says they might even predict earthquakes. This is because before an earthquake, there are changes in the chemistry of the ponds where toads live. The shifts in the ground causes these changes, which in turn causes the toads to flee their homes. Scientists believe we should study these patterns to predict earthquakes more accurately. Meanwhile, dogs can sense storms and thunder too. They feel changes in the air pressure in the atmosphere. Plus, they have a way better sense of hearing and smell than humans. 
When a storm is approaching, you can spot certain things in their behavior. For instance, they may become more restless or clingy. They may pant excessively or pace back and forth, and they may try to hide in a safe place. This is because dogs can feel the static electricity that builds up in the air before a storm, and they may become anxious or frightened by the loud noises and bright flashes of lightning. There were stories that dogs can predict earthquakes, too. But there's no firm evidence of that. But who cares? Dogs are our heroes even without that. Now, honeybees can sense changes in pressure and humidity levels as well. So they use this information to predict when a storm is coming. These are social insects that live in large groups in hives or colonies. That's why predicting weather is so important for them. They need to protect their hives and forage for food before the storm hits. So for bees, bad weather may come like a real vacation they've wanted for so long. Just some chillin' and eating all the food they've gathered before. Just like me, in a sense. Spiders have superpowers when it comes to weather, too. Well, they can't exactly predict the weather, but their behavior can give us a clue about temperature outside. When it's going to get colder, spiders might seek shelter indoors. So, if you see many spiders in your home, it could be a sign that colder weather is on the way. You may have heard snakes can predict earthquakes. The legend where this belief started actually dates back to 373 BCE, when snakes and other creatures are said to have left the area before a major earthquake in Greece. Cool story, but there's little firm evidence to support the theory. Scientists do acknowledge that snakes and other animals can sense earthquakes a few seconds before people do, because they can feel the initial wave better. But it's still not clear if they can detect it days in advance. How about sheep and their sixth sense? It allows them to predict rain or snow. They huddle together tightly before a storm, which could be a way to keep warm or protect themselves from the weather. But this theory needs to be yet appropriately tested and proven. You will hear wolves howling during big storms as well. Many people think wolves do it when a full moon is outside. But some experts believe the change in air pressure that comes with a big storm may cause discomfort in sensitive canine ears. And this is what makes them howl. But again, it's hard to tell precisely because wolves howl for many reasons. They do it to signal danger, attract a mate, and communicate with their pack. There's also no evidence the full moon fascinates them so much that they feel the urge to howl when they see it. But it's good for the movies, though. Sharks have ears sensitive to changes in air and water pressure that usually occur during hurricanes and tropical storms. Some experts believe they can detect these and quickly dive into deeper waters to stay safe. Studies show sharks behave like this many times before storms. Again, no one's sure 100% about this, but like many other animals, they do have a special ability to detect changes in their environment and use it to survive and thrive over time. You don't need to fly to another planet to discover some mysterious unidentified artifacts. People find them on planet Earth all the time. Take this funky metal disc. One internet user claimed to have found this item in a regular package of sour cream chips. The disc had a serial number, weight, and metal type information engraved on its surface. Unfortunately, it's not an ancient coin and not a box prize. It's the result of defective packaging. Manufacturers put metal test objects in some of the bags to test whether their X-ray detector works properly. That's how they prevent any magnetic rubbish in the bags, like splinters or tiny details from the machines. Ideally, the X-ray system should detect all the packages with metal objects and sort them out, but apparently, sometimes it makes exceptions. So if you find something like this in your chips, it makes sense to contact the manufacturers to help them prevent dangers for other people. They will have to do an internal investigation and fix the metal detectors and document flow. But the most important question is, to eat or not to eat? Well, the chips might be edible, but keep in mind that the disc wasn't completely hygienic when it fell on the conveyor. But no worries, usually manufacturers send a few boxes of their product and some money certificates as an apology. 
And since we're talking about packaging mysteries, did you know why shoe manufacturers often put these tiny tags in their boxes? In some cases, they just show samples of materials used to manufacture the shoes, but others look like multi-purpose souvenirs that can be used as a decoration for laces or a keychain because they have a special loophole on the top or a small chain. Metal shoe tags can make great zipper pulls for winter coats or bags, by the way. In any case, this is another opportunity for shoe brands to remind the customers about themselves. So if you ever find such a tag in your brand new shoe box, don't rush to throw it in the trash. Perhaps one day you'll be able to auction it as a rare vintage piece. A regular thimble helps to protect the thumb while sewing. It looks pretty compact and convenient. But what about this epic piece? Is it a medieval thimble for knights? A woodworking tool? Or a Halloween accessory? In fact, it's an antique finger guard for husking corn and similar tasks. It has a leather bracelet to fix the glove on the wrist and a special weave of metal links providing flexibility. You can also see it titled Oyster or Butcher Thumb Gloves because this tool was used for protecting users from sharp objects. This particular design was patented at the beginning of the 20th century in the USA. Imagine walking in the woods and facing this scene. Someone slathered a blue plastic can in grease, attached a bag, and hung it on a tree. What in the world would that mean? It's a DIY deer fly trap contraption. Studies reveal that flies are more attracted to blue things, which explains the color of the trap. Unlike the common flies, deer flies inflict painful bites, which may cause allergic reactions and spread diseases. So if you want to avoid special attention from these annoying creatures, don't wear bright blue outfits while hiking. As for the trash bag on the bottom, it's probably left on purpose to throw away the can after the trap expires. Ladies and gentlemen, fasten your seatbelts. Don't forget about your knees too. One internet user saw this unusual knee wrapping belt on a plane and posted it online to figure out its purpose. Any ideas? It's a sitting back support system with a knee strap. This product is designed for easing and preventing back strain caused by slouching and poor posture. Customers can use it daily for more comfortable sitting or driving. Unlike ergonomic chairs, this system is pretty handy and portable. Even NASA astronauts used it during space missions to take care of their bodies. Have you ever found a witch bottle full of weird mysterious stuff? Well, if the answer is yes, you probably know that it's a bad idea to open up an old jar unless you're 100% sure it's safe. But what about this confusing finding? Would you bet that this fluffy white stuff isn't toxic? No worries, unknown doesn't always mean dangerous. It's just a couple of silkworm cocoon balls. Some people store such things as a souvenir from a silkworm factory. Others use them as a fancy skincare product to remove blackheads and gain radiant skin. Here's another example of an unidentified bottle-like finding. Is it a genie trap or does it serve a more ordinary purpose? Sorry to disappoint you, but it's just an oil lamp. Before everyone started using electricity, these heavy, sophisticated tools helped to create light. Some of them have a more complicated design than others because they come with a mirror or reflector attached to them, or special details to reduce the heat and flame. But the technology is still pretty easy. Oil is put in the belly and the wick goes in the spout. When you light the wick, the flame burns on the end of the spout. Then you'll be able to carry this lantern around with you like a little candle, and you'll have the light to start fulfilling your three wishes on your own. Brace yourself, because the next one can be really triggering. Any idea what it might be? A prehistoric turtle, a high fashion jewelry piece, or a guest from another planet? Nope, those are the throat teeth of a freshwater drumfish. From the outside, drumfish look like many others, but they have a unique set of molar-like teeth packed together at the back of their mouth. These teeth are placed just near the throat, the dental formations vary depending on the species and their diet. This explains why their creepy throat pictures on the internet look slightly different. 
Seems like this design is meant to scare the life out of people with trypophobia. But in fact, they help to break down hard food, such as mollusks and crustaceans. The drumfish typically find their prey on small fishes or invertebrates. Although they lack teeth in the front part of their mouth, they can still eat hard-shelled food thanks to their pharyngeal teeth. So if you ever see this thing on a beach, don't rush to run away or faint. It won't bite you. What would you do if you dug a random item out of your own body? One Reddit user found a yellow plastic ball in his ear. It wasn't bothering him at all or affecting his hearing. His doctor made this discovery accidentally. After a brief research, he revealed that this ball was likely an airsoft pellet. But the reason why it was found in his own ear still remains a mystery. Let's take a look at this tool. Does it remind you of something? Maybe it's some kind of medical equipment accidentally dropped by a doctor rushing to their lab. Nope, it's just a Lego part. Although it looks pretty confusing when out of context, it's a pair of red balloons held by a figure. Case solved. Would you freak out to find this spiky plastic thing in a dusty attic? Looks like a mini board for standing on nails. But in fact, this piece has nothing to do with stimulating nerve endings. It's a drying rack with spikes designed for drying bottles or cups. They're placed on the spikes upside down, which provides convenient fixation until dry. Some say it's a great tool to dry sanitized bottles because it allows you to make sure that they don't come into contact with dirty surfaces. Statistically speaking, as I'll be doing here, you might have heard that a total solar eclipse is a rare thing. Sorry, but that's a bit of a myth. This phenomenon occurs approximately once every 18 months. The next one will take place in April 2024, so you can check it out yourself. Okay, and this one is pretty rare, but not impossible. The odds of being struck by lightning are 1 in 3,000. There are also some positive statistics. The odds that you survive the lightning strike are 9 in 10. Shocking. And what about having 12 fingers? Well, it's higher odds than a lightning strike. The experts give different figures, but it's about 1 in 500, 1 in 750, to 1 in 1,000 odds. And just think of the piano possibilities. Now, seeing a double egg yolk is just as unusual. You can find such a yolk in 1 in 1,000 eggs. They're usually laid by younger hens, and you know, they're rookies, still learning how to lay eggs right. Eh, just kidding. By the way, it's also possible to find a triple yolk in an egg. But this time, the odds are higher. It's 1 in 25 million. At least the British Egg Information Service says so. A guy from Australia found such an egg and shared the photo. He said the triple egg yolk tastes just like any other regular one. The world record is 9 yolks in one egg. Another record is that a woman from Britain found 29 double yolkers, and all of them were from the same package. Finding a four-leaf clover is considered to be a sign of good luck in Ireland, but this is pretty rare, and the odds are only about 1 in every 10,000 clovers. But Gabriella Gerhard of Fitchburg, Wisconsin, managed to find 451 four-leaf clovers in one hour. So I guess nothing is impossible. If you try hard enough, you'll probably even find a seven-leaf clover. But this time, the odds are 1 in 250 million. Can you imagine puffy chips? An Australian kid found one and shared it on TikTok. The story evolved so much that the girl even created a listing for the puffy chip on eBay. It all got pretty viral, and the bids were insanely high, like up to $100,000 for the chip. Eventually, the listing was taken down, but the kids still managed to sell it. The Doritos maker themselves offered a whopping $20,000 for this unique chip. On the other hand, your odds of being injured by a toilet are 1 in 10,000. Nope, I didn't make that up. This figure is quite official. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention made a whole study on this issue. And in most cases, it's due to accidental falls, or as we like to say, a wipeout. Winning a lottery sounds next to impossible, especially if it's a McDonald's Monopoly game. A Canadian structural engineer, Michael Ross, counted your odds of winning $1 million in the McDonald's Monopoly game. 
it's a whopping 1 in 451,822,158. Hold on, sorry, we can't mention Whopper when we're talking about McDonald's. Anyway, I'm not sure anyone can eat that many chicken McNuggets to get those tickets. Earning this money seems way easier. In comparison with McD, the Powerball jackpot seems somewhat easier to win. The odds are 1 in 292 million. But still, your chances are very slim, to say the least. Don't buy that boat just yet. Over to you. What do you think is more real, becoming an astronaut or winning the lottery? Well, it's becoming an astronaut. It's almost 40 times more real to go into space than to win the McD Monopoly thing, as the odds are 1 in 12,100,000. Back in 2016, 18,300 people applied to NASA, and only 10 of them made it to the training class, not to mention going to space. Now, if you're not satisfied with lottery-winning odds, but finding a job is not an option for you, I have a nice piece of information for you. The odds of dating a millionaire are 1 in 215. Now we're talking. Still, the statistics don't disclose information on whether the millionaire you may date is generous or not. Hey, don't take this one seriously. Go get a good job. As for jobs, how about becoming a writer? The statistics say that the chances you may become successful aren't that bad. For instance, the odds that you write a best-selling novel are 1 in 220. Almost like dating a millionaire, but in this case, you won't have to ask for money. It'll be all yours. You can also become an actor. By the way, it's easier to win an Oscar than to win a lottery. The odds of winning this magnificent golden statuette are 1 in 11,500. But to win the Oscar, you gotta become a movie star first, right? Well, prospects here are slimmer. You have a fat chance of 1 in 1,190,000, so they really aren't in your favor. But still, all this seems more probable than winning a lottery. By the way, why is it that fat chance and slim chance mean the same thing? Now let's see what your prospects of becoming a millionaire are. There are many ways to make money, but apparently, each of us has a 6% to 22% chance of becoming a millionaire. Even if it's 6 in 100, it sounds like truly positive statistics, not to mention 22 in 100. Turns out that the odds of winning an Olympic gold medal are very unlikely. According to some sources, it's only 1 in 662,000. Bravo to all the athletes who made it. Now, what do you think is rarer? Finding a pearl in an oyster or winning the Oscar? It's finding a pearl. The probability is approximately 1 in 12,000. Are you into bowling? It may seem like a piece of cake, but the odds of playing a perfect 300 game are 1 in 460. And this statistic is for professionals. Things are harder for amateurs. Chances are 1 in 11,500. Yep, it seems like bowling is as hard as getting an Oscar. Wait, does Michelle Yeoh go bowling? Of course, she can do everything everywhere all at once. (laughs) That's multitasking. Now, let's play a guessing game. What are the odds of becoming a centenarian? 1 in 5,000, 1 in 10,000, or 1 in 15,000? The right answer is 1 in 5,000. More so, they say that the youngest now have a much higher chance of living to 100 years and even more. If you ever pass the SAT, I hear you, it's a lot of stress. But next time your parents want you to study more to get a perfect score on the SAT, you can share these statistics. Back in 2015, only 504 of over 1.5 million students got every point. It's only 1 in 30,000, give or take. So don't sweat it. What are your chances of getting poisoned? Quite good, actually. No matter whether you eat in high-end restaurants or drive through takeaways, food poisoning chances are approximately 1 in 6. Yep, 1 in 6 Americans experiences food poisoning in a year. So dig in! Now, I don't really want to compare Harvard University to the lottery, but your chances of getting accepted into Harvard are way higher than winning a jackpot. Back in 2021, the acceptance rate was 3.2%, which is only about 3 students out of every 100 applicants. But then, you don't need to study hard to grab a lottery ticket. Hey, are you left-handed or right-handed? There are way more right-handed people, 85-90%, to while only 10-15% to are left-handed. 
But what about ambidextrous people? These folks are rare. Only 1 in 100 people is ambidextrous. No, if you can use both hands and handle some easy tasks with your non-dominant hand, it doesn't mean you're ambidextrous. To be such a person, you need to use both hands equally well. Hey, when is your birthday? It may seem that we all have a 1 in 365 odds of being born on any day of the year, but there's one exception. I'm talking about leap years and the 29th of February. There are 1 in 1,461 odds of being born on that day. It's easy to calculate. It's the number of days in 4 years plus 1. You may not have found any reason why you're unique in this list, but trust me, you are just by the fact that you were born. Scientists say that you had approximately a 1 in 10 to the power of 2,685,000 chance of being born. You see, for you to arrive in the world, your parents needed to meet, your grandparents too, and so on and so on and so on. Need I say more? Nope, I'm done. The Easter Island giant heads are so popular that they even have their own emoji. Their true meaning has been a mystery for hundreds of years. But it looks like we at least know how they were built and transported to their permanent location. The Moai statues consist of three parts. A large yellow body, a red hat or top knot, and white inset eyes with a coral iris. Around 1,000 of them were created. The main bodies of most of the statues were made out of volcanic tuff from a local quarry in what used to be a volcano. The material is easy to carve, but not so easy to transport. That's probably why researchers found over 300 unfinished moai back in the quarry. The rest of them stand in various locations, facing the villages as if watching over the locals. So, it looks like the statues were carved lying on their backs. Then, their creators detached them from the rock, moved them down slope, and set them in a vertical position to finish the work. Once it was done, it was time to get the statue to its platform. Now, if you've ever moved houses, you know how physically hard it is. So, imagine having to move a statue that is about half as heavy as a house without a car or any modern equipment for a distance of three miles. The locals must have invented some original way of doing it, and scientists tried to recreate it to guess what it was. They tried pulling Moai replicas on wooden sleds. They thought someone could have used palm trees for that purpose, but this theory has been debunked. The most successful experiment so far was wielding ropes to rock the statue down the road in a standing position. This method sounds real because the local Rapa Noai legends mention that the Moai walked from the quarry. And, of course, they needed a good road to get there. In the early 20th century, researcher Catherine Rutledge identified an 800-year-old road network on the island. It was a bunch of pathways around 15 feet wide going from the quarry. She thought that those roads were ceremonial and not built just for the statues. She wasn't a famous scientist back then, so others mostly ignored the theory. Several decades later, famous Norwegian adventurer and archaeologist Thor Heyerdahl published his theory. He mentioned that the roads were built exclusively to transport the Moai and some of the statues were dropped along the roads for some reason. But in 2010, researchers found that the statues weren't randomly dropped. They actually reached their final destinations as they were all set on hidden platforms. Plus, the road floor was U-shaped, so pulling massive statues along them wouldn't be easy. You can still find roughly 15.5 miles of these roads on the island and see them from satellite images. And it looks like Catherine Rutledge was right about them. The roads were probably built for pilgrims to a sacred volcano, and the Moai standing by them were sort of signposts. Halfway across the world in southern England lies another mystery made of stone. A massive sound illusion, a symbol of unity, a burial ground, or more. 
scientists are still debating the purpose of Stonehenge. It took Neolithic builders around 1,500 years to construct this beauty made of roughly 100 stones standing upright in a circle. Millions of tourists come to see it every year, and heritage protectors were worried about the modern road snaking close to the landmark. That modern road is now sunk into the ground below the grass level. And even though archaeologists assumed they could find an older road under it, they didn't have any high hopes. But when they took off a layer of asphalt, they noticed two parallel ditches that were nearly perpendicular to the road. The ditches connected the shortened sections of the avenue. That's what the archaeologists call the ancient pathway leading up to Stonehenge. It proves that the ancient people used to visit the monument for their purposes, and probably some ceremonies. Another interesting find during a dry summer was three dry patch marks within the stone circle. It looks like they were left there by three massive boulders. So Stonehenge could have been a full circle once. In 2021, archaeologists found a Roman road submerged in the Venetian lagoon. The fact that it runs there on the bottom for nearly 4,000 feet is proof that the Romans were here before sea levels rose and flooded the area. It supports the theory that there was an important settlement here centuries before Venice was founded at the spot in the 5th century CE. The ancient Romans were great at many things, and one of them was building roads. And it looks like they weren't afraid to work on the trickiest terrain. Scans have shown that the ancient road was built right on the beach, and it requires some serious skills. Imagine a village from over a thousand years ago frozen in time. There's still half-eaten food on the tables and personal things left in a rush. It's all preserved so well because it's covered by volcanic ash. Researchers found this village in 2011 in modern-day El Salvador. They believe there was a mass celebration in a Maya village called Seren over 1400 years ago. The whole village was there, preparing the main temple for a ritual when a nearby volcano erupted. The 200 plus residents had no time to rush back to their homes. To save their lives, they had to flee the plaza and run south on a raised road called Sakbe. They managed to escape from the plumes of volcanic ash. In addition to being a superhero and saving all the people, the road had another cool feature. All Sakbe roads had an outer layer of stones. But this one was made of ash. Ironic, isn't it? It proves that the Maya people didn't only use stones to build their roads. Archaeologists discovered several coins in Jerusalem when they were excavating an old street. When they saw the minting dates, they realized the road was built when Pontius Pilate was the Roman governor of Judea. Since he was the local ruler, it's almost clear that he gave the order to build the road. The pilgrims most likely used this road to reach the Temple Mount for worship. The pathway, which was laid with over 10,000 tons of limestone, was almost as broad as a London bus is long. It had been there for 2,000 years. It's not common that you find such a luxurious road, and it's not clear why a Roman governor would spend so much money on the road. It was probably his attempt to make the city's population like him. Plus, it was a great way to show he had both money and influence. The Old North Trail is an ancient highway that the inhabitants of North America used for 10,000 years. First on foot, then with dogs, and finally with horses. The first travelers moved around the continent down its paths for thousands of miles long before the first Europeans arrived, and even during the last ice age. They used it to carry trade goods, visit relatives, find a mate, or just explore. Researchers keep finding evidence that the stories and legends of the Blackfoot Indians about this trail are real. And it could be even the road that served one of the most massive human migrations. 
the people who crossed from Asia on the Bering Land Bridge about 15,000 years ago and settled in North America might have used the ice-free corridor along the Rockies, which later became a part of the trail. The Nakasendo Highway was built in the 17th century, during the Edo period of Japanese history, to link Kyoto and Tokyo. The 310-mile-long road runs across mountain ranges and down onto the plain. It was one of the five main roads used by the feudal lords and their families to travel to the capital. There were 69 post stations on the route where travelers could stay overnight. The road was built for horses and pedestrians, as the Japanese didn't use carts. You can still walk parts of the route. So, you're getting ready for your adventure in the land of ice and fire. But before you switch your phone to Volcano Explorer mode, hear me out. You need to pack properly to get the most out of your trip. Now, never underestimate the Icelandic weather. It doesn't matter if you're going there in May or January, you can expect all seasons in one trip or even one day. If you're going in summer, pack both light and warmer layers and some good hiking boots. You'll definitely need a waterproof and windproof outer layer. Don't be shy to bring an insulated winter jacket. It's always better to take them off than not have it and freeze. One more thing you need to know about the Icelandic summer is that between June 15th and June 30th, you can expect something known as the midnight sun. The sun doesn't set until after midnight, and even then, it barely goes below the horizon. So it looks more like the evening twilight. Unless your accommodation has extra dark and thick curtains, you might have trouble sleeping when it's so light outside. That's why it's a good idea to pack a sleeping mask. And for the daytime, you'll definitely need sunglasses and sunscreen. Or you could just pop by in December when it's only light for 4 hours and 7 minutes a day. Winter temperatures aren't as terrible as you might think. But the snow and wind coming from all directions make things worse. So focus on staying warm and dry. An insulated jacket, another warm layer or two, thermal pants, reflective waterproof pants to stay dry and noticeable in the snows, a good warm hat, oh, and sturdy boots will literally take you a long way. Ice cleats as an add-on will help you stay stable on icy terrains. Spring and fall are pretty short, just like my dad. And the weather is also super unpredictable. So the same set of items you'd pack for winter will do. Even if you're going to Iceland in the coldest weather, definitely pack a swimsuit. Iceland sea isn't the warmest in the world, but you'll need that swimsuit for outdoor pools and hot springs the country is full of. Since all the pools are heated with geothermal energy, they're always warm. The locals and tourists swim in all sorts of weather conditions. Yes, even in the snow. The Blue Lagoon is the most famous geothermal spa. It uses seawater coming from around 6,500 feet underground, and it comes with useful earth minerals. Once it gets heated up by a nearby geothermal plant, a mix of ocean and fresh water pours into a lava pool at a temperature of around 102 degrees Fahrenheit. It gets its postcard-worthy turquoise color from the silica in it reflecting sunlight. Definitely bring a reusable water bottle for the trip. You can refill it with tap water since it's perfectly safe and healthy. The country is full of pure springs and glaciers, and that high-quality water goes to every tap. There are zero chemicals in it, so it's officially some of the clearest kinds of water in the world. All you have to do is wait a bit when you change from hot to cold water. Hot water also comes to Icelandic homes straight from the spring and is heated by geothermal sources. The sulfur in it makes it smell like rotten eggs. Although it's yucky, it's totally harmless. Bottled water is overpriced and it literally comes from the same tap. Icelanders will have no problem speaking and understanding English. But if you want to feel more like a local, you could bring translation earbuds. Icelandic is pretty difficult to grasp on the go and might sound unusual. The language has less than half a million native speakers, but they're super proud of it, and it keeps growing. Instead of borrowing words from other languages for new concepts, they create new words or repurpose some old ones. The Icelandic for computer, for instance, totally translates as the number oracle. 
there are over 130 ways of saying wind, and 112 of them are written on a wooden walkway from the calmest to the strongest wind, just in case you want to learn them. There are also some concepts the English language just doesn't have. For example, this. Window weather. It's the kind of weather that looks good from the inside, but once you step out, you regret your decision. Makes sense to me. In case, for some reason, you were planning to bring a horse to Iceland, stop right there. The Icelandic horse is one of the oldest and purebred horses in the world, with a history of the breed going back to the 10th century. The story goes that the ancestors of today's beauties were carefully selected to be brought to Iceland from Norway during the Viking years. And no one has imported any other horse breeds to Iceland since the 11th century. It is banned by law. This complete isolation helps the Icelandic horses stay super healthy and live a long life. These beauties used to be the only form of transportation in the country. They've adapted to survive in all kinds of weather conditions and have grown, although they still don't look huge. And oh, when you see it, never call it a pony. It can offend the locals. Now, I don't want to be the one to tell you, but your wish won't come true just because you threw a coin in one of Iceland's thermal springs. The signs forbidding throwing coins are all over the place for a good reason. The coins keep hanging in crystal clear waters, ruining the natural look of geysers and pools. Plus, researchers have proved that coins and other trash can change the color of the thermal water for good. That's precisely what happened in Yellowstone. The morning glory pool changed its color from tropical blue to green with orange and yellow hues. If you don't want that to happen to the beautiful Icelandic landscapes, then keep the coins for souvenirs or in your pocket. Now, elves are a big deal in Iceland. About half of the population believes in their existence. The local folklore sees elves as the hidden people who live in the lava fields. When someone wants to build something in one of those, they have to take into account the elves' opinions. Yes, these guys have a spokesperson who comes to meetings. Sometimes road construction is even diverted around boulders where the elves live so not to disturb them. These little guys go house hunting during the winter holiday season. And it is 13 elves called the Yule Lads who bring the young generation of Icelanders their gifts. If you want to learn more about the elves during your trip, you can sign up for Reykjavik's Elf School. You'll get textbooks, a legit elf diploma, and tea with cookies as a bonus. They might seem like a regular photo prop, but these little pyramids of rocks actually have a name and history. The humans of the past used to build cairns to be used as kind of a GPS system long before the concepts of cars and GPS was even created. Travelers marked certain spots along their routes to help other wanderers find a path. They used to be the only way of marking the routes, and you can still find them all over the island. Iceland, of course, has GPS now, but it's illegal to move rocks from the cairns because they're considered an important part of history. Plus, some hikers still use those pyramids for navigation. So, if you randomly build one of those, hikers can easily get lost as they'd follow the wrong route. Oops! Now, if you want to bring a good gift to your new Icelandic friends, a book is a great idea. For many years, the country had the highest rate of publishing books per capita in the world. On average, 1 out of 10 Icelanders publishes a book in their lifetime. There's even a special book-giving holiday. Icelandic sagas go back to the 13th century. Writers create their sagas even on napkins and coffee cups. Each geyser and waterfall has its own tale about heroes and heroines attached to it. You can also scan barcodes on public benches to listen to audiobooks on your smartphone. Cool! There are many myths around arguably the greatest structure ever built by humans, the Great Wall of China. Some say it's so grand that it's visible from space. Others claim that you can see it from as far as the moon. Other theories suggest that the builders of the wall were left inside. Well, sorry to disappoint you, but all these impressive stories are just myths. But even with those stories busted, the Great Wall of China is an impressive and truly breathtaking structure. So let me tell you its true story. Today, China is one of the most populated countries in the world, counting as many as 1.4 billion residents. 
It's also one of the oldest nations in the world. It has 3,500 years of continuous written history. But the civilization existed long before that. There is a theory that while the European continent, for example, was most likely reached by humans from Africa, China wasn't populated by settlers that came from somewhere else. Some people believe that the Chinese civilization got formed from local Stone Age people who lived on the territory since the prehistoric period. So now, the Great Wall of China. It's truly big even by today's standard, stretching for over 13,000 miles. To imagine it better, it's almost five times the distance between New York and Los Angeles. Or even a bit greater than the distance between the North and South Poles. Even in modern times, people have never built anything close to this big. Of course, it didn't take a day to build the Great Wall of China. Two, eh, keep going. In fact, the wall was being built for centuries. Maybe you know that ancient cities had walls around them to protect themselves from invaders. Yes, Chinese cities had them too. The first Chinese emperor united the country in 220 BCE and got a brilliant but very ambitious idea to turn all city walls into one big wall that would defend the country's border against attacks from the north. A trusted general directed the construction, enrolling a big group of workers, soldiers, commoners, and convicts. Back then, the wall was built of rammed earth and wood. In some places that were strategically important, the sections of the wall overlap to provide maximum security. The walls were around 26 feet high on average. But the Great Wall didn't yet look like the construction we know today. Every next emperor would pick up the Big Wall project, strengthening and extending it, repairing, but also modernizing construction techniques. Some used bricks to build it. Others moved on to granite and marble blocks. Watchtowers and platforms weren't there from the beginning as well. They were added by Ming emperors. The watchtowers made it possible to communicate with other parts of the wall through smoke and fire messages. So the wall is quite inconsistent in terms of material, but it only adds more charm to the construction and shows how much effort and time it took. The reasons why some parts of the wall have been standing for centuries and are still in good condition is glutinous rice flour. Turns out, this sticky rice mortar is almost like cement. It's very strong and waterproof, sealing the bricks so tightly together that even sneaky weeds can't grow between them. You may also notice that some bricks have writings carved on them. They were left by the workers who were building the wall. The purpose of those writings is quality assurance. They contain such information as location, quantity, and responsible officials. So, in the case of some problems with the quality of materials or constructions, it would be known who should be held accountable for it. Recently, a research group has looked through official historical documents of the Ming Dynasty that ruled China from the 14th to the 17th centuries. They came across records of secret doors in the Great Wall. So they decided to find them. They used a flying robot to capture continuous centimeter resolution photos of the wall. They photographed 90% of the wall that was built during the Ming Dynasty and discovered the remains of over 220 secret doors along the wall. Some of them have a specific width and height that allows only one person to go through. Others are large enough to allow two horses to pass at the same time. Why are the doors there? Well, the Great Wall's main goal was to protect the country from the enemy. Building doors that could let the enemy in would undermine the whole point of having a wall. So, of course, the doors were secret passages. They perfectly matched the surroundings topographically. And the exit on the outside was camouflaged with bricks so that it was almost completely indistinguishable from the brick wall. The wall was never just a defensive wall, and it was never completely closed. It could be opened on demand. It was also a structure used for trade and commerce, communication between inside and outside the wall, and of course, for defense and spying. Some doors were used for trade with the other side. Through smaller doors, a person would sneak out to spy on the enemy that lived on the other side. The hidden gates were also useful for a sudden attack. 
As you remember, some gates were camouflaged with brick on the outside. The exit was so indistinguishable that the enemy had no idea exactly where it was located. The inside entrance for Chinese soldiers was hollow, so they could walk through the wall and break the camouflaged exit gate from the inside, starting their surprise attack. Now, even though the main point was to prevent outsiders from getting into the city, the wall wasn't too effective on that matter. It could still be climbed over or marched around. So the wall was being watched at all times, and the guards gave signals to the troops if they saw the enemy approach. Also, the wall provided more time to mobilize and bulk up the country's forces or lure the enemy troops into a difficult strategic position. The construction stopped at the end of the 19th century. The wall lost its strategic and military importance due to technological advances. Over the centuries to today, only 8% of the Great Wall is in good condition, and the rest is damaged. Also, around one-third of the wall has disappeared without a trace, due to both natural erosion and human damage. I guess you could say it's now just a pretty good wall. As you remember, the first parts of the wall were built out of rammed earth and wood. These are not the most unfailing materials if we're talking about thousands of years. Also, destructive farming methods have turned large areas into a desert and contributed to erosion. Also, many bricks were taken away from the wall in the last century to be used in building farms and houses. The wall is being deconstructed stone by stone even today, but this time by tourists. Quite a few of them take a stone as a souvenir. That's a total of a lot of stones, considering that over 10 million tourists visit the Great Wall every year. Since 1987, the wall has been a UNESCO World Heritage Site, highlighting that it has an outstanding importance to humanity. The wall is one of China's 56 World Heritage Sites, second place among countries with landmarks protected by UNESCO. Who's first, you ask? Well, the top spot, with 58 World Heritage Sites, belongs to Italy. And do you know that the wall isn't only a famous tourist attraction? but also the location of the Great Wall Marathon. It's a marathon that was established in 1999 and is one of the most challenging ones in the world. You guessed right, people run along the wall, including all the steps. There are three distances, so that participants can run a full marathon that is 26 miles, a half marathon that's 13 miles, or just have a fun run of 5 miles. Whale watching is a popular bucket list item, but getting too close to these gorgeous sea creatures isn't the best idea, especially if you don't want to kick the bucket too early. Whales are generally curious and friendly giants, but they can be unpredictable when you cross their personal borders. First of all, they are huge, and one wrong move on their side could flip over your boat or seriously hurt you. Second, they are wild animals, and like any other wild animals, they can carry certain infections they could transfer to you if you get into direct contact. Plus, they have strong parental instincts, so if you approach their young by accident, they might think you want to take them away and will act accordingly. It is only safe to observe whales from the sea when you're accompanied by an experienced expert, both for your own good and for the good of the whale. Now, sometimes whales and dolphins strand themselves on the shore for reasons scientists still can't explain. Quite recently, over 200 whales have been found on a remote beach in Tasmania, Australia. A rescue team rushed to the location to save the whales, half of which were still alive. The rescue operation was really complex due to the remote location. The locals were trying to help the whales, covering them with blankets and pouring buckets of water on them to keep them alive. This mutual effort of regular people and professional rescuers helped save around 100 whales. As to why this happened, one theory says the stranded whales might have had a leader who had some problems with orientation and took the whole pod to the wrong place. The Australian box jellyfish looks just like any other jellyfish you've probably met in the sea. But don't let these creatures deceive you. They're considered the most venomous marine animals. Box jellyfish got its name because it does look a lot like a box. 
unlike other kinds of jellyfish that float with the current rather than swim. This creature can reach a decent speed and choose its own direction. And here comes the scariest part. It has tentacles covered with tiny darts loaded with poison. Mm. People and animals that get unlucky enough to have a rendezvous with those tentacles face some pretty scary and sometimes even fatal consequences in just a matter of minutes. Before you decide to cancel your vacation by the ocean, you should know that only a few out of the 50 species of box jellyfish have venom that is lethal to humans. There are some not-so-dangerous species living in warm coastal waters worldwide, and the lethal ones reside in the Indo-Pacific region and northern Australia. Good day, mate! A blue-ringed octopus likes to pretend its only outstanding feature is the psychedelic color, but it can quickly and easily take away your life. This cute-looking sea monster likes to spend its time in the soft, sandy bottom or shallow tide pools and coral reefs. It normally hides in underwater crevices among shells or debris. If you somehow manage to find and disturb it there, the octopus will show you its signature blue rings as a warning signal. And if you don't get the hint, it will introduce you to its other signature feature, a venom a thousand times more powerful than cyanide. One octopus has enough of it to do away with 26 people within minutes. This venom is more toxic than that of land mammals. The octopus normally uses it to hunt crabs, shrimp, and small fish by pecking them with its beak and paralyzing them. The same can happen to a human victim. You'll unlikely even feel the bite until it's too late. The good news is that there have been no known cases of such incidents since the 1960s. If you don't disturb the blue ring octopus, it will never attack you first. If you enjoy picking shells on the beach, make sure the ones you collect don't belong to a cone snail. It's nothing like its relatives living on land and eating fresh leaves and bark. There are over 500 species of this venomous sea creature, and a few that can really hurt you. These little snails are extremely vicious, just like Jimmy from third grade. They inject their venom through a harpoon-like tooth. The consequences of this injection can be quite terrible for you. Now, are you afraid of snakes? Well, I have some bad news for you. You can escape them even in the water. Certain kinds of these creatures have adapted to live both on land and in the sea, especially in the warm waters of the Indian and Pacific Oceans. All the species we know so far are venomous, and sometimes an encounter with them can be super dangerous. The good news is that they only bite if you disturb them. So the safest way to go is in the opposite direction of these slithery sea creatures. Not only venomous sea creatures present a danger to you while you're in the water. Strong earthquakes sometimes cause the formation of massive ocean waves. If they head ashore, they hardly leave anything intact in their way. You know this dangerous sea phenomenon as a tsunami. There is also another type of this natural disaster called a meteo tsunami. They're caused by rapid storm systems and pressure changes above the open water. A powerful storm can generate a whole wall of water. Sometimes, this wall grows several feet high while it moves through a shallow continental shelf, inlets, or bays. If it gets strong enough, it can damage houses close to the water. It's really tricky to forecast or detect a meteor tsunami because it's nearly impossible to tell from a seismic one. It happens much more often than regular tsunamis, especially in the Great Lakes area. Now, the ocean can be dangerous to you, even if you're staying in what seems like safety on the shore. One such unpleasant surprise could be a sneaker wave moving your way. As you can guess from its name, waves like this sneak out on unsuspecting beachgoers. They look average, but turn out to be way bigger and more dangerous than you could imagine. Sneaker waves always appear without warning after smaller waves carry huge amounts of water, sand, and gravel. They're so powerful, they can carry swimmers further away into the ocean. They can swipe you off your feet and into the water when you're casually strolling on a jetty or the beach or on an outcropping nearby. Oregon State University researchers found that sneaker waves form in offshore storms that carry wind energy to the ocean surface. With all that energy, several waves unite and overlap into one beast that stands higher and goes further ashore than a regular wave. 
Another thing that makes them more dangerous is that they're hard to predict. The logic of regular wave formation doesn't work with them. Square waves, looking like a giant chessboard over the ocean, are the reason many people visit the Isle of Ré off the western coast of France. If you visit it, you'll notice plenty of signs warning you to stay away from the water once you notice the unusual pattern. The safest way to observe it is from high up places like nearby lighthouses. If you decide to stay in the water, the strong currents coming from two directions can literally sweep you off your feet. Generally, waves can travel many miles over the surface of the water, depending on local winds and weather. And even on days when the weather seems somewhat calm, storms located elsewhere can send in crashing waves that affect the surrounding calm waters. When waves travel onto the shores of distant lands, they're called swells. This is different from a wave that occurs from the local wind. When two different swells coming from opposite directions meet, it's known as a cross sea. This is what generates these square waves that you see near the Isle of Ray. The cross-sea phenomenon can appear in different locations around the world. The Isle of Ray is one of them, thanks to specific wind and weather patterns that create the perfect storm, which makes this cross-sea so beautiful and well-recognizable. Well, wasn't that swell? Um, swell? Eh, never mind. You know, scientists make discoveries that change the world, but even they can face mysteries. Here are 10 things that have baffled scientists. Imagine that you constantly hear a low-frequency hum, and no one can trace its source. Roughly 4% of the world's population hears the hum. It's a geography-free sound. I mean, people all around the world hear it, so the name varies from Taos hum to Auckland hum depending on the region where it gets generated. The sound is just on the threshold of human hearing. People hear it less when they're outside, and it gets louder indoors, especially at night. What's even scarier is that you cannot unhear it once you've heard it. Some folks say it started in London around the time of Charles Dickens, who wrote A Christmas Carol, and the low-frequency sound actually comes from the humbug. <laughs> or not. Actually, the earliest cases were recorded in Bristol, UK, dating back to the mid-1970s. Scientists have various theories about where the hum comes from and why only some people can hear it, yet they don't have a clear answer. It could occur when ocean waves move along the ocean floor, they shake the Earth when they collide with continental shelves, or this might be happening because of volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. Oh, and how about ultra-low frequency radio signals used to communicate with submarines or even 5G? Hmm. Upsweep is another type of unidentified sound. It was discovered in 1991 in the Pacific Ocean. The sound is high enough to be recorded throughout the ocean. Scientists theorize that the sound could be related to underwater volcanic activity. Interestingly, the volume of the sound has been diminishing compared to its volume when it was first discovered, yet it still can be detected. Plus, it's seasonal. It reaches its highest volume in spring and fall. Is it related to seasonal changes? No one really knows for sure. The next mysterious thing is a cone-shaped monument found in the Sea of Galilee in Israel. This monument was discovered accidentally by sonar scanning in 2003, but the findings were published only in 2013. The monument weighs 60,000 tons. It was once submerged by rising waters. Archaeologists say the monument is enigmatic because they can't figure out where it's from. They don't know what it's connected to or its function. So this big and unusual thing remains a mystery. Now let's move to Gobekli Tepe, Turkey. This place offers you one of the most archaeologically significant sites in the world. Why is it important? Well, it has massive carved stones about 11,000 years old. To put it in perspective, they're 6,000 years older than Stonehenge. Ancient people placed these stones before they began farming or crafting metal tools or pottery. So the existence of this place goes against the chronology of civilization we're familiar with, where people farmed first and built second. Apparently, it wasn't like that. In any case, a good question is, what was the purpose of this site? Was it built to worship some spirits? 
Yep, archaeologists believe it might be the world's oldest temple. Okay, say this with me. Paleodictyon notosum. Yeah, I know it sounds like a chemical formula. This is a living fossil found deep down on the ocean floor. A creature makes these hexagonal burrows, that for sure. Yet scientists can't identify the artist. Now, what do I mean by living fossil? Well, Paleodictyon notosum is a creature believed to produce a burrow nearly identical to Paleodictyon fossils. Is it a worm-like animal that made them? Scientists don't know. One thing is clear. This isn't some random stuff created by geological forces. Now, speaking of fossils, take a look at this giant one. Its informal name is Godzillius. It was discovered in 2011 by an amateur paleontologist. This is a scientist who studies the history of life on Earth by analyzing fossil records. Anyway, back to Godzillius. It's almost 7 feet in length and 9 feet tall if you were to measure it upright. This fossil is 450 million years old, coming from the time when Cincinnati was underwater. It might be a fossilized algae mat, but some scientists have different opinions. This is a massive tunnel found in South America. The tunnel is at least 8,000 to 10,000 years old. At first, researchers discovered a couple of colossal burrows. They were enormous and neatly constructed. Geologists were amazed, saying they had never seen such structures before. There's no known geologic process to explain their formation. I mean, researchers have known about the burrows since the 1930s, but back then, they believed that these tunnels were just some sort of archaeological construction until they discovered huge claw marks on the walls and ceiling. They reasoned that some extinct species could be the ones to have left these marks. Many geologists strongly believe they found the burrows of giant ground sloths and armadillos. The structure is the largest known burrow from the Paleolithic age in the Amazon. Yet experts have many questions. How come such a deliberate-looking structure could form naturally? A researcher then discovered another strange cave. This one was hundreds of miles away from the massive tunnel. Fast forward, there are now more than 1,500 burrows from the Paleolithic Age found in Brazil. What's even more interesting is that some of these caves are connected to tunnels that sometimes lead to chambers. I'll continue with a natural phenomenon. What if I told you that every year, especially in October, fireballs appear on the Mekong River in Thailand? According to legends, Naga fireballs are a call for Buddha to return to Earth. And river serpents are the ones making these calls. Well, that's a myth. But what does science say about it? Is it related to a flammable gas? There are no clear answers yet. These fireballs appear to rise from the water. They can go as high as almost 990 feet. They're like fireworks, disappearing rapidly. They typically glow with a reddish or orange color. I'll mention some legends too, because why not? They're thrilling. And it would be a shame not to include the one about the lost city of Atlantis. As you may know, the legend says that Atlantis submerged into the ocean around 11,000 years ago. Since then, not just scientists, but also treasure hunters and philosophers have been searching for the lost world. Could Bimini Road be a trace? In 1968, a diver found strange stones off the coast of North Bimini Island in the Bahamas. The stones look human-made. It's like they were evenly spaced out and laid in an orderly row. It baffled scientists, but not for long. Carbon dating analysis of the blocks revealed that geological forces created the road naturally. There weren't any tool marks or signs indicating that the blocks had been stacked or something. The research is continuing, but yeah, scientists generally believe that the rocks were created by erosion. Well, I guess the time of Atlantis hasn't come yet. Okay, picture this. You're wandering on the beach, and you see dozens of octopuses walking past. In 2017, a group of people from Wales witnessed exactly this. Why did these creatures come out of the ocean? No one knows the answer. The group reported that they had seen 20 to 30 octopi crawling on the sand. The people looked for some signs of injury, but found nothing. They said that they had carried the animals back to the ocean. Interestingly, these creatures kept crawling onto the shore when people were asleep. 
Experts say that it's hard to be sure of the reason that pushed the animals to the beach without conducting a physical examination. They're still speculating about the reason behind this unusual and rare occurrence. Could it be overcrowding? Furthermore, the octopi were (laughs) well-armed. A separate study points out that the more fishers hunt large animals that feed on octopuses, the more the octopus population grows. Maybe that's why these creatures have to go farther to find food or shelter. But without proper research, these are only theories. There's a lot we don't know about space, too. So here's a bonus fact about the yellowish source of life in the solar system. Scientists have discovered a new type of wave inside the sun. These waves move in the opposite direction to the sun's rotation. Plus, they move super fast. So fast that it's beyond our understanding. Researchers have different theories about the function of the waves. If they figure out their role, this could give them additional insight into the processes happening inside the sun. And yes, the octopi were (laughs) well-armed. Have you ever sat in the bathroom, wondering why toilet paper has fancy patterns on them? Well, if you're in there long enough, I guess you would finally get around to that. Turns out, those prints actually serve a purpose. They use the prints to fluff up the paper a bit and make it more absorbent. The unique patterns help differentiate different companies' products on the market. Also, recycled toilet paper is a thing. But it's not as popular or well-sold in the U.S. as it is in Europe and Latin America. And that's all I have to say about that. Ah, yes. One of the greatest mysteries of the snack world. Why do crackers have holes in them? Crackers start out as hydrated dough, which means that they have a lot of wet ingredients in them compared to dry ones, like flour and salt. So when hydrated dough bakes, it releases steam as they get heated through it results in something called an open crumb. It's a texture that is full of small air pockets. If we need a perfectly crispy cracker, the dough needs to release the steam that's accumulated in there. And that's where the holes come in handy. And all that crisp is thanks to them. Now, this star, some old houses and barns have, isn't something we pay attention to. But it's very familiar. It's known as a barn star, regardless of where it's located. Put it on a castle, it's still a barn star. No one is sure where exactly it takes its roots and what it originally meant, but they became particularly common for people to use at the end of the 19th century. Apparently, people used to paint geometric figures on their barns, and each one would mean something. The star was believed to bring good luck. Some people also interpret it as signifying welcome, and they started to put it on houses. Other people just say that they look cool and only serve a decorative purpose. Now, I'm pretty sure you've noticed that electrical plugs have Mm. holes in their prongs. But what are they used Mm. for? Well, a century ago, when the first plugs were designed, they had prongs with indents. Those indents would align with bumps inside the sockets to secure them there, so that it won't fall out. Later, the indents were replaced with holes, and it was for the same purpose. Modern-day plugs don't need holes to be secured inside. They're secured with friction and pressure. Holes are still useful, though, but only during manufacturing. Some insert a rod through the holes to keep them steady while they wrap them in plastic. Other than that, holes have no use, and they are optional, so the manufacturers can decide if they have them or not. I was driving a couple of days ago and noticed those trees that you paint white at the bottom. Turns out it's a common thing to do. You see, the lower trunks of trees are painted white to help the process called sun scald. Sun scalding happens in the winter, and it's the process where extreme fluctuations in temperatures causes the bark of the tree to split. The layer of white paint serves as a long-lasting tree sunscreen. They also use this method of painting the tree trunks in orchards and tree farms. It's done to protect the young trees and give them the best possibility of surviving their first years. I've noticed that in older cartoons, quite a bunch of characters wear white gloves. I did some research and found out that back when animated movies were black and white, putting white gloves on characters was a way to make the hands stand out from the black bodies. Then animation evolved, but the gloves stayed as a Disney tradition. But there are other reasons, too. Human hands make animal characters more humanized and relatable. 
Also, those gloves are way easier to animate, which speeds up the process. Also, many cartoon characters have four fingers, and there are reasons for that as well. First, only drawing four fingers makes the work of animators easier. While human figures were portrayed more realistically, animals and other characters could be fine with four fingers, and the creators were taking advantage of that. Also, there's a visual reason. Walt Disney himself told once that if this famous mouse had five fingers, his hands would look like a bunch of bananas. Growing up and watching morning cartoons before school, I never really understood why some of the adult characters didn't show their faces. Turns out, I was halfway to knowing the reason. The adults weren't the main focus of the shows. They were just there doing their adult stuff, while the main characters, often young age characters or animals, were doing all the fun stuff. But the adult characters were always there to keep an eye on the main characters and help them if they asked. From an animation standpoint, it was also cheaper, easier, and way less time-consuming for the animators back then not to do the faces. This way, they wouldn't have had to do the faces or synchronize the lips for every speaking segment the character might have had. They could also just reuse old animations or change as little as possible if the writers changed the script at the last minute. It was saving companies lots of time and money. Now, we've all seen a house with two chimneys, but do they have an actual purpose, or is it purely for the aesthetic? Turns out they actually did have a purpose back in the day. In the older houses that are located in colder climates, it was fairly common to have one chimney with two or more separate flues, passages for conveying gases to the outdoors. Back in the day, houses weren't as airtight as these days, so they needed more heating sources to stay warm. People had fireplaces and several wood-burning stoves. Having several flues allowed residents to vent all those gases at once. Modern houses are built way more airtight and isolated, so they don't really need more than one heating source to stay warm and cozy, even in colder climates. So the two chimneys serve more of an aesthetic purpose. Also, they're costly to remove, even if someone lives in an older house. Sometimes, car steering wheels are grossly sticky, and here's why. Steering wheels are often covered with materials like vinyl or leather, and both of them are prone to collect surface residues like dust, food grease, oil, and sweat from your palms. Even if you don't feel like your hands are dirty when you touch the wheel, there's always something on them, and that material is happy to keep it. At some point, surface residue accumulates enough to give you that sticky feeling. You have two solutions. Either wear driving gloves or just wipe the steering wheel once in a while, and you're golden. I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but some school buses have white roofs. Apparently, roofs are painted white to ensure that the inside is cool on hot days. The thing is that dark colors, especially black, absorb light and heat. That's why asphalt is especially hot on hot days, and that's why you feel hot in dark clothes in summer. A white color, on the other hand, reflects the light and the heat, and everything gets heated less fast. If you've traveled, you could have noticed that the same temperature feels different in different places. 80 degrees Fahrenheit in Nevada is much more tolerable, but the same 80 degrees Fahrenheit is a whole different story in Alaska or Florida. And the key here is humidity. It's the amount of water that's contained in the air. Nevada is the state with the lowest humidity, 38%, and Alaska has a humidity of 77%. Here's how it works. One of the ways your body tries to cool down during hot weather is by sweating. As the sweat evaporates, it takes away the heat as well, and it leaves. In humid settings, the sweat evaporates less, staying on your body and just dripping down. So not only do you stay all wet, but the heat also stays, so you feel hotter. But hey, don't sweat it. Just stay inside near the air conditioning all summer. Don't go out at all. Well, that's not going to work. Hello, distinguished guests, and welcome to Aquarium Bright. Here, you will get to see the most dangerous sea and ocean creatures. But don't let what I said mislead you. It's very well possible for you to come across one of these underwater animals during a walk on the beach. So, take a look at them carefully now, and you might just avoid a disaster. Is it fish or is it stone? What you're looking at is commonly known as the stonefish. 
but its fancier names include the Dornorn and the Sinansia. If you're into diving and observing the underwater, you might already have come across one without noticing. Its appearance makes it almost impossible to distinguish it from a real stone due to its gray coloration and mottled appearance. Especially if you're wearing fog snorkel goggles, so you better pay attention because otherwise the consequences can be unfortunate since stonefish are the most venomous fish known. Although some types of stonefishes are known to live in rivers, and most of them are found in coral reefs near the tropical Pacific and Indian Oceans. Their needle-like dorsal fin spines stick up when they're disturbed or threatened and inject the poison they contain. The most common reason why stonefish stings occur is swimmers stepping on them without realizing it. However, you don't need to be in the water to get stung. Since they can survive out of the water for up to 24 hours, you'll have to watch where you step when you're at the beach as well. Those who got stung by stonefish describe their experience to be extremely distressing. Their venom can result in infection, and in some cases, it is known to cause shock and paralysis. It might come as a bit of a shock, but despite its bad reputation, stonefish is edible if it's prepared properly. When the fish is heated, its venom breaks down. And if the dorsal fins, which are the main source of its venom, are removed, raw stonefish is served as part of sashimi too. This creature might look like it came out of a science fiction movie, but it's very much real. Say hello to the blue-ringed octopuses. Don't be deceived by their small size, which can range between 5 to 8 inches, including their arms, because they're packed with venom to cause great damage to as many as 26 people within minutes. Just like stonefishes, blue-ringed octopuses are found in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, from Japan to Australia. They typically live on coral reefs and rocky areas of the seafloor. Some may also be found in tide pools, seagrass, and algal beds. Blue-ringed octopuses are not aggressive in nature. When they're not seeking food such as crabs or shrimps, or searching for a mate, they often hide in marine debris, shells, or crevices. It's only if they're provoked, cornered, or handled that they get dangerous to humans. When they're threatened, they turn bright yellow or blue iridescent rings appear all over their body as a warning display towards the potential predators. Their bites usually come unnoticed, so you might not be able to realize you're bitten until it's too late. The venom of a blue-ringed octopus can cause dizziness and loss of senses and motor skills, and ultimately, paralysis. So, better try to keep your hands to yourself and back away in a hurry if you see one. Nope, it's not a flower bouquet, so don't try to pick and smell one of those pink tube-like things. What's standing before your eyes is a marine animal called a flower urchin. It may look gorgeous, but don't let the looks deceive you. It was named the most dangerous sea urchin in the 2014 Guinness World Records. Flower urchins inhabit the tropical areas of the Indo-West Pacific and are found among coral reefs, rocks, sand, and seagrass beds at depths of 0 to 295 feet. The most noticeable feature of them is their pedicularia, which are claw-shaped defensive organs that are also found in sea stars. What makes flower urchins differ from any other sea urchin is the fact that their pedicularia is, as the name suggests, flower-like and usually pinkish-white to yellowish-white in color, with a central purple dot. Hidden underneath those flowers, they possess short and blunt spines. Although many sea urchins deliver their venom through such spines, flower urchins deliver their venom through their pedicularia, or flowers. If they're undisturbed, the tips of these flowers are usually expanded into round, cup-like shapes. On their surface, they possess tiny sensors with which they can detect threats. And once they contact such threats, these flowers immediately snap shut and start injecting venom. What's weird is that the little claws of the flowers can sometimes break off from their stalks, stick to the point of contact, and continue injecting venom for hours into whoever touched it. Yeesh! Looks like a giant puddle of melted strawberry ice cream, right? You wish! It's a lion's mane jellyfish, which is also called giant jellyfish, arctic red jellyfish, or hairy jelly. They're known to prefer cool water. That's why they can mostly be found in the Arctic, northern Atlantic, and northern Pacific Oceans. 
but it's possible to spot them around the British Isles or in the Scandinavian waters too. Lion's mane jellyfish are one of the largest known species of jellyfish. They get their name from their long, flowing hair-like tentacles and can reach lengths up to 10 feet. And although the average bell diameter of a lion's mane jellyfish is around 20 inches, they can sometimes attain a diameter of over 7 feet. The largest lion's mane jellyfish recorded was seen in 1865 off the coast of Massachusetts. It was measured to have tentacles around 125 feet long and a diameter of 7 feet. To help you picture it, this is longer than a blue whale. Lion's mane jellyfish hunt by extending their tentacles outward and creating a trap to catch their food. Since they have around 1,200 stinging tentacles, the fish would have to be extremely lucky to be able to escape them. The sting of a lion's mane jellyfish is usually not life-threatening, but you would still want to avoid swimming into its tentacles because it can be very painful to humans. And if you see one washed up on the beach, better not touch it because it can still deliver a sting long after they've been on the shore. Fun fact, the lion's mane jellyfish appears in the Sherlock Holmes story, The Adventure of the Lion's Mane, as a suspect. But don't worry, we won't give you any spoilers. The last marine animal you're seeing now is a sea snake, and yes, they are different from eels. There are 69 identified species of sea snakes. Most of them can be found in the tropical and subtropical waters of the Indian and Pacific Oceans, and they have been around for millions of years. To make things easier, scientists have separated all different species of sea snakes into two categories, true sea snakes and sea crates. Whereas true sea snakes spend almost all their time at sea, sea crates can spend some time on land as well. If you see a snake on the beach, you can tell whether it's a land or sea snake by looking at its tail. If it's paddle-like, then that's a sea snake you got there, but make sure to keep your distance in both cases. All sea snakes need to surface regularly to breathe since they have no gills. That's why you can come across one while swimming. If that happens, you better swim away as fast as you can because most sea snakes have more venom than the average cobra or rattlesnake. However, since they only attack if provoked, bites are quite rare. One more cool fact about sea snakes, they are the only reptiles to give birth in the oceans. The majority of sea snakes keep the eggs within themselves and give birth to nearly fully formed snakes while swimming. That's except for the yellow-lipped sea crate though. They come onto land to lay eggs of their little ones. Remember the stonefish from the beginning of our tour? They're hunted by sea snakes. Blame the food chain. From thousands of dollars worth of treasure to brand new phones and ancient cities, let's dive into the water and see what we can find. Imagine going to the river to enjoy a boat ride. Who wouldn't want to take a couple of pics to make the memories of this trip last forever? Oops, the water's flat. Luckily, you've taken precautions and put your gadget in a waterproof bag. But what if you drop your phone to the bottom of the lake along with this case? This is what happened to some people. A scuba diver and a YouTuber dived into a river popular with tourists and lost some of their gear worth $20,000, including new iPhones and some jewelry. Oops. You might be familiar with the image of a car getting pulled out of the water, either from the movies or TV news. Large cargo vessels sometimes sink and trucks inside them go along. That's what happened with the Thistlegorm wreck. It sunk in 1941 in the Red Sea, and these Bedford trucks were inside. Want to see something more valuable, like treasure? A British cargo ship was carrying a heavy load of silver ingots, but the vessel sank. Treasure seekers knew there was silver on the ship. Since the 1940s, they've been looking for it. The Odyssey Marine team got lucky. They made the discovery in 2011. The treasure was more than 14,000 feet below the surface. The ship had carried more than 110 tons of silver ingots. Finders keepers! The Odyssey team kept 80% of the treasure and gave 20% to Her Majesty's Treasury. Of course, there were more items on the ship, like letters, teapots, and silk sheets. 
You can see them in the exhibition called Voices from the Deep at London's Postal Museum. Now how about some underwater art? Sure, here you go! Polynesian Moai statues. These statues have been discovered in several areas across the world. For instance, Easter Island is full of different size statues, but many of them can also be found in Cancun, Isla Mueras, and Punta Nizu, Mexico. Seeing full-body statues from thousands of years ago under the water would probably be a lifetime experience. Gold coins are also popular items found in shipwrecks. Many divers come across coins worth a lot of money. But there's one diver in Florida who truly hit the jackpot. In 2015, they stumbled upon nearly $1 million worth of treasure. The discovery was 51 gold coins, 40 feet of ornate gold chains, and a rare coin that was made for Philip V, the King of Spain. They were once frightening and dangerous, and they still look spooky. Yo-ho! I'm talking about pirate ships. One pirate shipwreck from the 18th century was excavated off the coast of Colombia in 2015. The treasure found there was worth between 4 and 17 billion dollars. It contained precious stones, gold, and many other items. The next one is an underwater city. Neapolis is a city washed away by a tsunami. It was built on the coast of North Africa nearly 1,700 years ago. Divers uncovered the city's remains in 2017. Researchers have also discovered Roman columns, as well as household goods and tools. Now, let's go all the way back to 1503. Portuguese explorer Vasco da Gama was fighting a storm when he lost his ship Esmeralda. The ship was discovered in 1998, but it had to wait for more than a decade to be excavated. Researchers found navigational tools there. They didn't have as much value as Spanish gold, but they were historical treasures. Now, in Amsterdam, they fish for bikes in canals. One third of working Amsterdammers cycle to work. Others use their bikes for different purposes, like exercising, going shopping, and so on. There are more bikes in Amsterdam than permanent residents. Unfortunately, many bicycles and even some cars end up in Amsterdam's canals. The fact that Amsterdam has 165 canals with a combined length of 60 miles doesn't make the authorities' job easier. Obviously, the owners don't throw their bikes into the water. Bikes can end up in the canals because of strong winds, vandalism, theft, or by accident. Every year, authorities fish up between 12,000 and 15,000 bikes. Our next one is a lost city. Heraklion was ancient Egypt's gateway to the Mediterranean. It became submerged and hidden under the sand. This city was famous. Maybe you've even heard about it. It was mentioned in the legend about Helen from Sparta and Paris from Troy. So, how was this ancient city discovered? In the early 2000s, a team of divers found a huge fragment of rock on the seabed and took it up to dry land. It turned out that it was a piece of the statue of Hapi, who was the lord of the river of ancient Egyptians. The team continued searching and found six other pieces. Around them, they saw temple ruins, pieces of pottery, jewelry, coins, oil lamps, and so on. Even an old copy of the New York Times. Nah, not really. Granada Underwater Sculpture Park is the world's first, what else, underwater sculpture park. Why is this park so special, besides being located in the beautiful waters of the Caribbean? You can see the park on a snorkeling or scuba diving trip. The sculptures are about 9 to 16 feet underwater. The atmosphere and the experience itself make it special. The sculptures are made from concrete and steel. Some of them weigh as much as 15 tons. They're covered with underwater creatures. The statues were put there to help protect reefs, maintain the health of the ecosystem, and restore underwater life in that area. Now, submarines are designed to go underwater, so maybe you wouldn't expect to see them on this list. But submarines do, in fact, sink. Divers have discovered many submarines. For instance, an Australian submarine was found off the coast of Papua New Guinea more than a century after it had sunk. 
Now here's another submerged city, but this one was left underwater on purpose. You can see the ancient ruins of Lion City in a lake in China. This lake was created in 1959, when the valley, at the base of Five Lions Mountain, was flooded to create a hydroelectric power station. The 1,400-year-old city, now ruins, got submerged by this flow and stayed this way for over 50 years. It lay untouched at the bottom of the lake until its exploration started in 2001. Divers found out that many structures, carvings, guardian lions, and arches were still preserved. Researchers mapped and documented Lion City. They also looked for a way to protect these structures from further damage. In 2011, the city was announced to be an historic relic under protection. When you see the ruins of Lion City for the first time, the view will take your breath away. So don't forget to hold your breath. Imagine swimming in the dark waters. As you're approaching the city, you see its huge walls and extensive carvings. Marvelous, isn't it? The Cancun Underwater Museum is probably the largest museum of its kind in the whole world. It wasn't lost, per se, but now it's home to an aquatic ecosystem. Who wouldn't want to combine scuba diving and snorkeling with a visit to a world-class garden with 500 sculptures? Placed 30 feet under the surface, these sculptures are made from pH-neutral marine concrete so that they can stay on the ocean floor. Plus, here, the sculptures change over time, unlike in a traditional museum. That's because they become part of the underwater environment and a home to various plant and animal species. In one installation, nearly 450 life-size figurines are grouped together to hint at the harmonious coexistence of humanity. There is also the Anthropocene, which is an actual submerged Volkswagen Beetle placed by the Manchonis Reef. Okay, this is not a lost and found item, but this is just… hey, it's a giant jellyfish and I wanted you to see it. This creature is known as the lion's mane jellyfish, and is the largest known species of jellyfish. So I'm happy now. And have you ever discovered anything underwater? Bright, colorful flashes of pink and green light up the sky. You're watching it from your backyard in Pennsylvania. That's not something you're used to, but it's very likely to happen more often in the near future as the northern lights are shifting south. Northern lights, or auroras, appear as a result of solar storms. The sun is a huge ball of molten gases that are constantly moving, so such storms aren't rare. Our star produces a huge amount of energy that goes our way. It travels as electrical charges at the speed of about 3 million miles per hour, no big deal. When all those tiny particles from the sun reach Earth's atmosphere, they give some of the energy to atoms and molecules in its upper layer. The atoms and molecules can't hold it and give it off as light. You can see it as spectacular auroras around the magnetic poles of the northern and southern hemispheres. If you were watching them from space, they'd look like large ovals. The brightness, colors, and shapes auroras take depend on the altitude where the lights are formed and what particles take part in the process. In the Northern Hemisphere, locations like Alaska, Canada, and much of Scandinavia normally get to see the brightest lights. The biggest solar storm ever was recorded in 1859, and it was so powerful that the Northern Lights were spotted in Cuba and Honolulu, and Southern Lights were seen as far up as Santiago, Chile. In latitudes like that of New York, people were able to read newspapers in the dark under those Northern Lights alone. If something similar happened today, it would have caused $1 to $2 trillion in damage. With solar activity and pressure from the solar winds increasing, the aurora belt's borders are currently shifting south. Solar activity goes in cycles, each of them 11 years long. We're now in solar cycle 25, which started in December 2019, and will reach its maximum strength between November 2024 and March 2026. So, geomagnetic storms will become stronger and probably even reach G5 levels. Those levels are their strength ratings. For you to see the northern lights south of the Great Lakes, a storm must be rated at least G3. G5 storms will be able to produce auroras that will even reach Florida. In case you don't want to wait for the sun activity to peak in 2025, head north if you're in the northern hemisphere, or south if you're in the southern hemisphere. 
auroras down there are known as the Southern Lights, or Aurora Australis. It doesn't have to be cold for you to see the Northern Lights, it just has to be dark. Auroras are active throughout the year. You can't see them from April to August in the northernmost parts of the world because it's light 24-7. It's also important that there isn't any precipitation or clouds in the sky. Those will block your view. Light pollution won't help either, so move away from any cities. Try to get to an elevation to maximize your chances of spotting the lights. They can appear in a whole variety of colors, including white-gray. The green-yellow part you're most likely to imagine while thinking of the lights is just the easiest to spot with an unaided human eye. Sometimes you might not see the lights at all, but your camera will still catch them. They might seem dangerously close to Earth, but the closest the northern lights ever get to us is 50 miles. For comparison, planes normally fly at around 6 miles above the surface, and that already seems like a lot. The distance from Earth defines the color of the auroras. When atoms giving us this spectacular show collide closer to Earth, you can see blues and violets in the sky. Green and red auroras are born further away from our planet. Earth isn't the only planet to have northern lights. Jupiter and Saturn both have strong magnetic fields, and scientists spotted auroras up there using the Hubble Space Telescope and the Cassini and Galileo spacecraft. It looks like Saturn's auroras are also caused by solar winds, but it's not so clear about Jupiter. Despite what you can often see online, the northern lights aren't going to disappear altogether. Once the sun passes its activity peak and becomes less active, both the northern and the southern lights will happen less frequently, but will still be gorgeous. Another beautiful rare phenomenon is called the green flash. It happens shortly after sunset or before sunrise when the sun is almost entirely below the horizon, and the Earth's atmosphere bends and scatters light from it. People mostly spot it over the ocean. It can also be yellow, blue, or purple. About once a year, you can spot a rare fire NATO in the US. Fire tornadoes start when a strong wind picks up heat from a fire. They are made of a flame or ash. They're different from regular tornadoes because they don't start from cyclones. Fire nados are about as tall as the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Unlike fire nados, fire rainbows or rainbow clouds don't cause any damage at all as they don't have anything to do with fire. You can only see them when the sun is very high in the sky and its light is passing through ice clouds, so they're pretty rare. The rainbow halos are just as unique. Again, it takes a specific type of ice crystals in the clouds of the surface of the Earth to bend light from the sun into a perfect ring. The same thing can happen with moonlight. The only difference will be that the moon halos are usually white and sun halos can be rainbow colored. A white rainbow is another rare illusion, this time created by fog and water. Like a usual rainbow, it's formed when light is shining through droplets of water. It loses color because fog droplets are hundreds of times smaller than those of rain. A white rainbow is sometimes mistaken for a moon bow. You can spot this one at nighttime as the moon illuminates it. That's why it's not so bright. If you ever see an upside down rainbow in the sky, that's a circumzenithal arc. It's not really a rainbow, but a kind of halo like those around the sun or the moon. This optical phenomenon is caused by ice crystals in the upper atmosphere. You have the best chance to see a circumzenithal arc when the sun is rather low in the sky. It happens super rarely, but it can rain without a single cloud in the sky. It's sometimes called a sun shower because it looks like the rain is falling straight from the sun. In reality, rain clouds are at a distance from that specific location. With sun rays being angled, the clouds become out of sight. Then, it takes just a little wind to blow the rain in your direction. If you ever travel to regions with high altitudes, you might see something called penitentes. Those ice spikes form only in a really cold and elevated environment where the air is dry. The sunlight turns ice directly into vapor instead of melting it into water. That's why these blades of snow and ice up to 15 feet tall start to pop up on the surface of the Earth. One of the rarest types of clouds is lenticular clouds that look like giant mountain hats. They're formed when moist air travels over a mountain or a mountain range and gets into an area of turbulence. Volcanoes can produce bolts of lightning. 
They're formed in columns of volcanic ash through friction and static electricity to connect the positively and negatively charged particles. To understand how it works, you can rub a balloon across your hair or your feet across a carpet and then touch a metal doorknob. Once a year, just for a few moments, a waterfall in Yosemite turns into a fireball. In winter and early spring, two streams flow down El Capitan Mountain in perfect conditions in February when the sun is hiding behind the horizon. It gets into the right position to reflect off the wall and color the water into fiery orange. Discovering hidden places on our planet is extremely exciting. Today, I'm taking you on a trip that you aren't going to forget anytime soon. But suit up, this is about to get very cold. You hop on a plane and land on the ice-covered island of Greenland. An unbelievable view of the Aurora Borealis, aka the Northern Lights, is greeting you. You can't believe your eyes. Your guide tells you how rare this phenomenon is. Usually, people spend days trying to hunt it down. You feel lucky and take your time to appreciate these beautiful dancing greenish lights. You're glad you brought your camera along, aren't you? Between clicks, you learn that the Aurora Borealis is the result of some rather rough events. This spectacular light show occurs when energy particles from the sun slam into Earth's upper atmosphere. On day two, you continue to explore the place by air. This may not come as a surprise, but Greenland is one of the world's largest islands. This time, on board a helicopter, you can see the infinite icy landscape. In case you're curious, you're now flying over 656,000 square miles of thick ice. Oh, what's that down there? It looks like a family of polar bears. You don't want to get too close, of course. The conditions in Greenland might be too tough for people to live there, but some animal species do very well in this land of ice. Those are reindeer, wolves, and arctic foxes. On your way to Greenland, you probably made a pit stop in Copenhagen. Denmark is one of the few countries that have commercial flights to Greenland. You didn't know this before, but you find out that the island is actually part of the Kingdom of Denmark. On a map, it's right between the Arctic and Atlantic Oceans. You're lucky to have a local pilot that tells you about the secrets hidden in this scenery. Under this two-mile-thick white surface, there's an entirely different world. A world filled with canyons, meteor-carved craters, and millennia-old plant fossils. You are beyond excited to go visit one of these spots, but of course, you'll have to use your imagination, as all of it is hidden under ice. Believe it or not, nearly 80% of the island's surface is covered with it. The first stop on your tour is Greenland's Grand Canyon. You land not far from it, somewhere in the northern part of the island. You may know that canyons are deep, narrow valleys with steep sides, but I bet you didn't know that the word canyon actually comes from the Spanish word canyon, which means tube or pipe. Now, this Grand Canyon has some similarities with the one in the US. First of all, in size, it's at least 460 miles long and up to 2,600 feet deep in some places. There's a true subglacial valley down there, and if you're wondering how this happened, well, the canyon had probably been formed by a river that had been flowing through Greenland before the ice took over. Oh yeah, Greenland hasn't always been covered with ice. It was once green, no pun intended. Many other icy places on Earth, such as Antarctica, were once covered in greenery. Scientists have figured out that in the past, Greenland was mostly ice-free. With the help of airborne radar, they made amazing discoveries. By the way, ice is invisible to radar technology. If you have trouble believing it, try putting an ice cube inside your microwave. It won't melt or heat up. A recent discovery of fossilized plants allowed researchers to estimate that Greenland used to be much warmer than they could imagine. 2021 research conducted by the University of Vermont found fossils of twigs and leaves, which left researchers very confused. They expected to discover sand and rocks in the deepest layer of ice, but instead, they found some clear proof of rich flora. Judging by what you've seen of the landscape, it's hard to believe that forests were once growing here. Today, you'll find some tundra vegetation on the coastal part of the island, and that's pretty much it. But according to the genetic material found in these fossilized plants, researchers believe the island used to be much greener. 
it's very likely that there were insect-filled forests with butterflies and beetles flying around. And the average temperature on the island varied from 50 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer to 1 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter. NASA's Operation Ice Bridge has flown over Greenland more than 100 times. This has allowed researchers to create 3D maps of the island and figure out the age of each layer of ice in Greenland's ice sheet. Ice sheets can help answer many scientific questions as they form over the span of thousands of years. They're layers of snow on top of more snow. The snow gets compacted into ice, which in turn creates what we call an ice sheet. Remember those fossils we were talking about? They're believed to be from the Eemian period, which was 130,000 to 115,000 years ago. According to the groundbreaking 3D footage from NASA, we can see three distinct climate periods within the ice sheet. The uppermost layer is quite flat and uniform. If you decided to dig deeper, you'd find the layer formed during the last ice age. It's more complex and rugged. The ice there is darker than what you see on the surface. If you let your mind wander, you can picture what this part of the world looked like when mammoths were roaming around. If you kept digging, you'd eventually find leftover ice from the Eemian period I've told you about. Now, canyons aren't the only unusual thing found under ice. If you could sneak a peek under all those layers of snow, you'd see an impressive mountain range and also plunging fjords. In 2017, scientists created a map that showed what Greenland had looked like without all that ice. There was a bowl-like depression in the middle of the enormous island. This depression was most likely an ancient lake. Around it, there was a circle of coastal mountain ranges. This scenery probably resembled the landscapes of modern Patagonia. Big mountains with snowy tops surrounding crystalline lakes. This ancient lake in Greenland is a wonder on its own. Imagine a pit the size of Rhode Island and Delaware put together. The lake is believed to have covered over 2,700 square miles, and back in the day, it was fed by at least 18 different streams. These crystalline blue waters were surely very inviting and freezing, of course. But if you ended up going for a swim, I'd say be careful, as the water could get up to 800 feet deep in some places. On day three of your adventure, you discover a true under ice water park. While you're wandering around the ice covered island, your guide tells you to be mindful of the cracks in the surface. These cracks are responsible for the modern day aqua lounge going on down there. Meltwater and rainwater flow down the cracks in the ice all the way down to the riverbeds. This forms a landscape of jewel-like lakes and streams filled with crystalline water. Researchers estimate that about 60 small under-ice lakes exist there. And yes, they're actual lakes. Perhaps one of the most impressive hidden features on this island is a meteor crater. Under the Hiawatha Glacier, you can find a 19-mile-wide impact crater big enough to swallow the city of Washington. Apparently, a mile-wide iron asteroid struck Earth's atmosphere within the past 100,000 years and chose Greenland as its landing point. If anyone had been around to see it, they'd have witnessed a real show, a white glowing fireball cutting through the sky. Scientists speculate that if it had landed on an ice sheet, it certainly vaporized both water and stone. Someone standing hundreds of miles from the impact site would have heard a deafening thunderclap and experienced hurricane-force winds. But it actually makes sense. The approximate speed of meteors entering Earth's atmosphere is 45,000 miles per hour. For comparison, that is two and a half times the speed of a spaceship. It's bound to make some noise and leave a huge crater in the ground. You're relaxing at the beach when suddenly you notice a huge flock of birds. They're excited about something near the water. You get the urge to go and investigate what's going on there. Here's some advice. Sit back down and stay away from the water. I get it, you think you're tough enough to handle a few pecks from a seagull. But it's not the birds that have me worried. It's what's lurking beneath the water. Fish are a staple of many diets across the animal kingdom, both above and below the ocean. Tuna, squid, and octopus, as well as marine mammals like seals, all prey on a wide variety of smaller fish. Species such as bluefish and striped bass are their favorite dinnertime meal. They're also the favorite of another ultra predator, which is why you shouldn't join those birds by the water. 
If you do, you're risking an encounter with a creature that can measure up to 20 feet long. That's three times the size of an average human. These are the size credentials of a great white shark. If there are fish around, they may come up near the ocean's surface to feed. A great white shark has the strongest bite force among animals. The only other animal species that comes close to them is the saltwater crocodile. And boy is their ability to catch whiffs strong. Scientists believe it to be more than 100 times stronger than a human's. They don't even use the nostrils located beneath their snouts to breathe. It simply serves as a specialized sniffer. Thankfully though, we're not the favorite meal of a shark, and the creature isn't going out of its way to hunt us. Researchers claim that the odds of being attacked by a shark are as low as 1 in 3.7 million. When unfortunate meetings between sharks and humans do happen, a shark may mistake a human for a seal or an extremely large striped bass. This is why you should stay away from those birds and fishes and just let the other animals animal. You just focus on catching a tan in that sun chair. So I guess this means that sharks have poor vision? Not quite. Their vision in clear water is up to 10 times better than that of humans swimming in the same environment. The structure of a shark's eye is quite similar to that of our own. It consists of a cornea, lens, retina, deep blue iris, and the pupil. Their eyes have two types of photoreceptors, rods and cones, just like humans. Although we're not too sure how well rods and cones perform for sharks, research has shown that they possess only one type of cone. It means they most likely don't have full color vision like a human. This might explain why they can sometimes mix humans up with other creatures. But hey, who's ever really fully focused when they're about to devour their dinner? Shark eyes also have tapetum lucidum. This is a layer of mirrored crystals located behind the shark's retina. These crystals allow the shark to see quite well in extremely dim light and murky water. The crystals reflect incoming light, which gives the rods inside the retina a second chance at detecting light that they might have missed the first time around. Fun fact, cats also have tapetum lucidum. This is why your cat's eyes glow in the dark when you shine a light on them. Another telltale sign that sharks may be hovering around in nearby waters is the presence of whales. Sharks have been known to stalk the creatures for over 100 miles. They'll follow pods waiting for one of the members to become vulnerable before expertly striking. So, lesson learned? If you now see birds by the water, it's probably not a good thing. Unlike when you see thousands of birds flying together through the sky. This is known as murmuration. You can see thousands of starlings unite together in the sky, moving in unison, dipping and swerving at the same time. It's like they're competing in some sort of synchronization event at the Bird Olympics. This happens when the birds begin to roost. It can be as early as September in some places and as late as the end of November elsewhere, with more birds joining the nightly displays during this time. Are they doing it for our entertainment? Well, not really. Grouping together in the sky offers protection from predators, like falcons. It can also get cold when you're flying that high up. So, the birds gather in their thousands to keep warm and exchange information on potential feeding sites. Okay, so in this case, a huge group of birds doesn't mean anything evil. But if you ever see some flying towards you whilst in a wooded area, it's probably time to leave the area. Birds and other animals flee wildfire areas. Certain mammals, like amphibians, may actually stay in the fire. Instead of fleeing for their lives, they will dig underground to escape it. But nearly all other animals will try their best to leave. Oh, and don't forget to jump out of the way whilst all those animals are running towards you. Why don't we switch back from birds to sharks? Yes, we now know if there are birds near the ocean surface, then sharks will probably be quite close as well. But what if there are no sharks anywhere near at all? If you ever happen to be in the ocean and notice some sharks heading deep towards the bottom of the ocean, this may be a sign that a hurricane or a tropical storm is on the way. Sharks can sense the drop in barometric pressure that accompanies the storm, so they could be trying to get out of the hectic zone. 
Sharks don't quite care for humans, so they don't view our sandy beaches and inland towns and cities as safety zones. They're quite intelligent creatures and know the deeper they go in the ocean, the safer it gets. But the ocean's not always the best place to go in an emergency. Case in point, if you come across sea creatures who usually live in water randomly resting on the sand, don't get inside the water. This is a sign that the water is potentially toxic. It's possible that a red tide is congregating in the water near the beach. Red tides happen all over the world, but one algae species causes them in the Gulf of Mexico. A red tide occurs when the water is full of more toxic algae than normal. It can make the water reddish or brown, but sometimes the water's color is normal. If you go in the water, you might experience respiratory irritation like coughing or an itchy throat. If this happens to you, you should thoroughly rinse your mouth with fresh water. Speaking of water, frogs are famous for their croaking, but if you've ever heard them do it a lot more than usual, it might be because it's about to rain. One theory says that this might have to do with their mating. They first do it, then lay eggs in bodies of fresh water. A good rain means more watery real estate for the frogs. That's why male frogs invite the ladies for a date before the showers with a croaking symphony. If you hear a lot of buzzing around, meaning the bees are more active than usual, a storm could be on the way. When they feel like it's approaching, bees start working even harder and faster to collect more nectar before the storm. And once they're done with it, they'll always come back to the hive 10 to 15 minutes before the heavy rain, even when there are no obvious signs of it. Their secret is super sensitive hairs on their back that can pick up electrostatic buildups from storm clouds. <laughs>